Okay. Well, it is exactly 6.30, so I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of November 28th, 2022. The meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand electronically and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Here. Councilmember Uring? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. You have a quorum. Okay. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance should you so desire. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which, which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. all. Okay, may I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on November 18th, 2022, with the amended agenda posted on November 23rd, 2022. And Mayor, would you like to ask for an approval of the agenda? I did that out of order. May I have an approval of the agenda? I so move. Paul? Okay, I, have a, and I, I have see Stephen. Steve, yeah, you're in hand, yeah. and I see Steve McClary's hand. Steve. I would just like to suggest we've got two items on the agenda tonight, items 4A and 6C that relate to the Malibu Farmers Market. I would suggest we may want to put those together and do them one after another. It may make our life a little bit easier. So if that's acceptable to everybody, I would just move 6C up and make it 5B and do one after another. They could actually be heard together. Yeah. Okay. So that's. So we move it to 5B instead of. Uh, I'm sorry. Move it to 4B instead of 6C. Or you 4B just, is you, fine. You, okay. you could just move it to be heard at the same time as 4 right, However, yeah. Trevor knows more about this. Yeah, we have that. a motion to hear 4A and 4C at the right time, at the same time. For a second. I'll second it. It's 4A and 6C. 4A and 6C. Just be precise. I think Karen moved to approve the agenda, so she needs to accept that, and then it becomes part of the motion. Thank you. Karen, will you accept that? Yes, I do. Thank you. And I and I pre-seconded it in advance of knowing what she was going to say. All right. So we have a motion and a second to approve the agenda with the change of hearing 4A and 6C consecutively. Is that correct? I believe correct. it's concurrently, Mayor, to hear the items together. As okay. One. okay. I'll, I'll go for concurrently. Will you, you take the roll, please? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Cool. Okay. Uh, we have a few ceremonial presentations today, and I'm going to lead off with the presentation the of a commendation to Barbara Bruderlein. Barbara is present, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, we do have her in the meeting. Okay. 
Whereas Barbara Bruderlin has served the Malibu business community as the local Chamber of Commerce's Chief Executive Officer since July of 2016 and Whereas Barbara immediately began working to overhaul how the Chamber connected with its members by establishing and hosting a robust calendar of regular events, by taking a central role in producing the Malibu Guide and revamping the Chamber website to increase each member's presence on the site, and whereas after the Wilsey fire, Barbara quickly organized the Rebuild Malibu Mixer, where homeowners who lost properties could connect with each other and contractors, and whereas throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Barbara has been a valuable collaborator with the city by helping to ensure local businesses were constantly updated with the latest information about how to comply with state and county orders and protocols. And whereas Barbara has always made herself in the chamber available to the city, working closely with city staff on numerous events, including the annual State of the City Address and Veterans Day Ceremony, and was dedicated to maintaining a strong relationship with the city and the chamber, and now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Malibu commends and thanks Barbara Brutalin for her years, years of dedicated service to the Malibu business community and her steadfast commitment to maintaining and enriching the bond between the City and the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to go on my video, but just want to say I'm so, so grateful and surprised. And um, I want to say I'm, I'm grateful to Honorable Mayor Prasanti, and I'm getting looking forward to get to know uh, the Honorable Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. And also, uh, thank you so much to the Honorable Mikey Pearson for all the support you've given to the chamber. <laughs> and uh, Council Member Farrer and Council Member Uring, uh, thank you so much, and to uh, Steve McClary. And I, I, I just want to say that as a chamber, we're just a conduit, a conduit. We're a voice for all the people that give and receive, and uh, hands handing along gifts to the needy and giving money to help that happen, and. Um, we're all tending the garden in front of us, so I'm grateful to have that opportunity to be able to do that. And uh, thank you. Thank you again. I'm really just honored. I appreciate it so much. And I, I do want to thank the, the board of directors, Danielle Dutcher, who took my newsletters at 3 o'clock in the morning and double-checked them to make sure that the information going to everybody at the crack of dawn about the pandemic updates was correct. <laughs> so many great people who, like uh, Los Angeles Valley College, who gave a quarter of a million dollars to our uh, artists who lost all their artwork and, and supplies in the fire. These voices that you don't hear that, that helped us. And um, I'm grateful to each and every one of them and to all of you and to the city. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Barbara. I think I see Mikey's hand. Yeah, I, I did. I just want to add to this. I brought this forward, and it's actually the proclamation was really, really well written. That was excellent. Thanks for reading that, Paul. It just was, Barbara, it really was very, very noticeable to me that when the Woolsey fire hit, when the pandemic hit, that you took action and you didn't sit around and and wait for things to happen. You You took action. The meetings you had to help people that were dealing with losing their home, um, gathering uh, people together to help each other in that event. And then straight into the pandemic, I don't actually, I never really asked you how you did it, but you put out some of the best information I saw anywhere and um, helped out with grants to uh, local businesses, um, that whole program. And it's just really noticeable that you raised the bar. And then by joining with the Palisades recently, I think that was a brilliant maneuver because it's really hard to run small chambers, as we know. It's 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 incredibly difficult. And that was a very, very smart move. So I just applaud you and thank you for, for all that you've done. Thank you, Mikey. 
We have another commendation. This is a presentation of commendation to Chris Frost. And I understand Chris is in the, on, on the, on the uh, I see you on the Zoom here as well. So I'm gonna read this. Whereas Chris Frost was originally appointed to the Public Safety Commission in January, 2007, by then council member Joanne House to fill a vacancy due to a commissioner's resignation. Whereas in recognition of Chris's obvious dedication to the community, he was subsequently appointed to continue his service on the Public Safety Commission in 2006 by then council member Andy Stern, in 2010 and 2014 by then council member Laura Rosenthal, and in 2019 by council member Mikey Pearson. And whereas Chris is well known and respected throughout Malibu, so residents often bring issues to him knowing that his ties with the members of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's and Fire Departments will help bring those concerns to the forefront, in particular traffic safety issues on PCH and throughout the city. And whereas in 2021, Chris was appointed to the newly formed Homeless Task Force where his experience working with the staff and public safety agencies has provided valuable insight for his fellow task force members. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Malibu commends and thanks Chris Frost for his years of service dedicated to securing the safety of the Malibu community and its many visitors. And I see Mikey's hand. <coughs> oh, you can let Chris speak. I didn't even realize my hand was still up, sorry. Okay, Chris, you're up. <coughs> wow. Thank you, Paul. That was, uh, I have a feeling Mary had a hand in that. So um, I'm very honored to, uh, it's been my honor to represent Malibu on, on many different fronts during this tenure. And I feel that we have accomplished a lot and have left the future of this commission on a very steady platform. I've worked with wonderful chairs, vice chairs and commissioners and wonderful city council members. The commissioners I have worked with have, in most cases, all brought something to the table and helped make our community safer. Um, I was doing a little math earlier. and I, I figured out that I've worked with six captains at Lost Hills, six lieutenant liaisons, including Captain C2, who was a lieutenant liaison when she was first introduced to our city. And I mean, numbers, tens of numbers of deputies. And of course, the many years that we all spent with Mike Trinan. Um, our VOPs led by Mark Rooster, Guy Blake, and Bill Melcher have become a model for this program throughout California. They have been a huge blessing to this community, and I'm proud to have spent so much time <clears throat> in their presence helping them wherever I could. I want to give a big shout out to the city staff, and I hope I don't miss anybody here, but I'm sure I will, who I have relied on constantly to educate and help me to make good decisions. Susan Duenas, Luis, Sarah, the fire liaisons, Gabe. Greg Bradley, Chris Broussard, Jerry Vandermeulen, Public Works with Rob DeBoe, Arthur Travis, and Brandy. You have all been a wonderful part of this journey, and we have experienced major fires, floods, pandemics, road closures, beach closures, boats on the beach, roads caving in, and a slew of other problems together. Also, Chief Drew Smith, who has raised the bar very high in this community. You have been a blessing to work with. And I'm going to go back, and I'm going to thank Joanne House, Andy Stern, Laura Rosenthal, and Mikey Pearson for my Public Safety Commission appointments, and also Karen Fair for my appointment to the Homeless Committee. And to Jeff Jennings, who probably doesn't really realize this, but he, he point, probably doesn't even remember it. He appointed me to the Blue Ribbon Committee <clears throat> for the Civic Center Traffic Study over 20 years ago. And that was my first foray into city government and created a jumping off point to public safety. I actually worked with Carol Randall on that committee and you know she went a long way in teaching me what public safety was all about i believe that when jeff appointed me he appointed me because i was so annoying to the city and asking the city to reopen civic center way after they had seemingly shut it down permanently in winter canyon <clears throat> so thank you jeff most of you will remember that i see paul smiling and steve smiling so um and a big thank you to uh to mary linden for her patience with me over almost two decades and her ability to make a motion out of what sometimes wasn't even good gibberish. Many years back, Mary asked me what I thought my role was as a public safety commissioner. 
after she told me that my role, our role, was to give recommendations to the city council based on the items in the agendas that were given to us. Well, I thought about that, and then I put my own spin on it. <clears throat> I said my job as a public safety commissioner was to do an act in whatever capacity was necessary to create a safer community in the city of Malibu. And I have tried to live up to that ever since. So thank you, city of Malibu, for the opportunities that you've given me. And uh, I would I would do it exactly the same if I had it to do over. And I don't know if I've got another 20 years in me, but, you know, I look forward to, uh, uh, you know, some happy moments with the city going forward. And I, I want to make one last comment that I hope in the future that the city will provide a workshop for incoming commissioners where they can learn about what their responsibilities are as commissioners. The Brown Act discussion can be made a part of this, obviously, but too many times there's no experience coming in and a great deal of time is spent bringing these new recruits up to speed, you know, when they're really at ground zero. And I would be glad to volunteer my time to help with such a program. I think it would be helpful to all the city council members as they approach their uh, appointments. And, uh, and I hope those appointments are thought through carefully. And thank you all, one and all. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to recognize Mikey, followed by Steve Uring, followed by Karen. Chris, you're a public safety legend in Malibu. I mean, you're, you are you only told about 20% of your history in public safety, going back to, you know, you're a member of Arson Watch, Neighborhood Brigades, you've helped out there. You mentioned the Homeless Advisory Group, obviously the task force, but your own, you know, own career and, and wildfire. Um, I remember very well when I approached you to be my commissioner. I think, I'm not even sure if I was elected yet. I don't remember anymore. But the one thing I said, I said, hey, I really want you to step up and be a leader. And um, you have exceeded that on every single level. And you have never stopped pushing and pushing me all for the greater good. And, um, you know, and uh, the amount of hours you put in, Listen, just one phone call with you is a lot of hours. So um, <laughs> I had to make Steve laugh over there and Paul. Uh, but I, I appreciate you more than you'll ever know. You've taught me so much. And it's been more than my honor to work with you and uh, help you um, for everything we've been through, everything the city's been through. You're a legend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Mr. Uring. You're muted. You're muted. Being on the city council has had some pluses and some minuses, but one of the real pluses is I've, I've had the opportunity to make some new friends. Uh, and I think Chris, at least in my mind, Chris Frost has been one of those. Uh, I have got to know him. I got, I have got to know the, the work that he does. I've learned to appreciate how much he, effort he has put in to help this city out. And Chris, you have made the phone calls are long. But uh, the conversations are well worth it, and it's been a pleasure knowing you. So thank you very much for everything you've done. Thank you, Steve. Karen, you have the floor. Thanks, Paul. Chris, I just want to echo everybody else's comments. I want to thank you for all your years of service, for your huge depth of knowledge, for your willingness to help at all times, uh, just like tonight, offering uh, with any uh, possible orientation for new commissioners. Um, just everything you've done, uh, I just wanna thank you on behalf of everybody at the city. And I'm sure so many people have benefited from your effort who don't even know who you are. But I just, I really appreciate the diplomacy that you've exhibited, your professionalism, your compassion, and um, I particularly appreciate you uh, accepting the uh, uh, appointment to the Homelessness Task Force when that was formed uh, as one of my appointees. So thank you so, so, so much and, uh, and onward. Great. Okay, moving on to item number 1C, we have a presentation of 2022 Jake Corrigenian Award, Citizenship Award. The award will be, the presentation will be made by Parks and Recreation Commission Chair, Dane Scopehammer. 
Dane, you're on. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> uh, the Jay Krugin Citizenship Award was created to honor the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Deputy Hagop Jake Krugin and recognizes outstanding individuals who have donated time and resources to enhance the quality of parks and recreation programs within uh, the Malibu community. Um, our first award recipient is Rich, Richard Lawson. Mr. Lawson has been a teacher and a coach at Malibu High School since 1996 and began the football program at Malibu High School the same year. As a high school physical education teacher, he focuses on positive outcomes through physical and mental growth. Additionally, Mr. Lawson has instructed surf programs for the city of Malibu since 2006. His commitment to teaching safety and respect for the ocean has positively impacted his students and the community. Uh, coach Lawson was my football coach, and I would like to say for myself and for all your former players that I could not have asked for a better coach, mentor, or role model. Thank you so much, Coach, and congratulations. Well, thank you very much, Dane. I really appreciate those kind words. And uh, I'd like to thank also the, uh, the City of Malibu um, board and uh, for this honor. You know, when I started at Malibu High School in 96 to uh, start football in a, in a community that, um, you know, hopefully uh, I know I, all the history, they had had youth football for many years and then it fell off. But more important than just the football experience was um, the fact that my ability to be able to reach out to some of the young younger kids in order to try to get them to prepare themselves if they were going to choose different sports. And I believe it was, I think I started with uh, with Amy. Some of the first camps were just like a form running camp. Uh, we did a little football camp. We did a track and field camp. And then I remember when Amy said, well, would you like to do a little surf camp? And that's really what we took off with was the uh, Aspect Surf Academy camp. and um, you know, I'm, I really feel like I'm one of the luckiest guys because, you know, I get to be around young kids. And a lot of times I tell young kids, I'd rather hang out with you than adults. because Generally, uh, your kids are a little bit more receptive on certain ideas and things. But however, um, it's been a great, great fun group of uh, years. And I, I really wanted to thank a couple of people involved with the city, uh, their uh, community service program. First of all, it was Amy many years ago. And then uh, Kirsten and Katie, Brittany, Adriana, Justin, these are all names of people that if you go to any community service function, they're there and they work very hard. I was very fortunate to recently go to the, uh, the Trunk and Treat Halloween for the young kids, also for the little kids, the uh, Olympic. And I really kind of, you know, getting involved with this, I had my, my own children. I had three young children under the age of uh, six when I started Malibu High. They're all grown. And, and I'm happy to say that my one son, Skyler, has taken over and uh, is continuing with the Aspect Surf Academy summer surf camps. And um, you people have given me a great opportunity to reach out into the community, um, try to help the young kids in the way of activities and sports. And at the end of the day, the smile on the kids' faces, hey, that's what it's all about. So thank you all very much for this, uh, this distinguished award. Um, I'm very honored to be in the same company as many of the past recipients. Many of them I worked with, some I still work with, and uh, it's just been, uh, been a great ride. So thank you all, I appreciate it. I've got Karen has her hand raised, but don't go away, Dane. I'm, I need you afterwards. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, Rich, I just want to say thank you also um, on behalf of everybody in my family. Uh, you taught at least two of my kids PE. I'm not sure if the third one, but I just I want to thank you for bringing a sense of partnership between Malibu Middle and High School and the whole Malibu community and the city of Malibu and just your generous attitude uh, and your enthusiasm. And like you said, uh, your love of working with youth uh, and getting them uh, more, more ready for, for life through sports is something that has been a huge benefit to Malibu. So I just wanna thank you so much. Thank you, Karen, much appreciated. 
Okay, Dane, I don't think your your work is complete yet. So can you our second yeah, our second award recipient is Judy Villablanca. Mrs. Villablanca served on the Parks and Recreation Com Commission for over five years. She was instrumental in developing the several developing several parks and recreation projects and programs, including the temporary and permanent skate parks, the earth friendly management policy, and restoring native habitats in city parks. She currently volunteers with the Malibu Monarch Pro Project, Karma Rescue, and Westside German Shepherd Rescue, in addition to serving on the city's Earth Friendly Management Working Group. Congratulations, Judy. Is Judy with us? I am with you, yes. Um, thank you very much for this award. It has been uh, an honor and a pleasure to serve on the Parks and Rec Commission and get to know the commissioners I've worked with, the city council members, um, and I also want to second uh, my in, in, um, my respect and um, and thanks to the uh, community services staff who does work very hard and they're very creative and and they've just really you know make a lot of our visions uh, come true. I think for me the most exciting part was really bringing the skate park to Malibu because I think it's our signature sport and looking at the participation of from kids to adults since it's been there I think that's great. I look forward to the permanent one being there. Um, I'd like to thank Rick Mullen and Bruce Silverstein for appointing me to the commission and giving me the chance to serve. Um, I, it's been a pleasure to live in Malibu, and uh, I love this community, and I hope I will continue to get a chance to contribute back to it because it's a, a beautiful place and want to make sure everyone enjoys it from the natural areas to the uh, signature sports we have here in the ocean and, um, and also our skate park. So thank you very much for this award. Thank you, Judy. I see Steve's hand raised. Uh, yes, I just, I've known Judy a long time and, and she's another one of these people I consider my friend. Uh, she has been instrumental in helping me come up with better ideas, dealing with the environment, dealing with the skate park. Uh, we've talked to her about what's going on over at Winding Way with the MRCA. Uh, she has just been a, a invaluable assets to Malibu. So Judy, I want to thank you very much for all that you've done. And I hope that we can find ways to continue, you know, can have you continue your contributions in the future. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Hey, that brings us to item number 1B, which is the Zone Haven Evacuation Tool Zone Map Tool. I'm sorry, Evacuation Zone Map Tool. Presentation will be made by LA County Fire Department Community Services Liaison, Megan Courier, and LA County Fire Department Assistant Chief, Drew Smith. Well, good evening, City of Malibu. Megan and myself, yes, would like to go over Zone Haven and the concept of Zone Haven. Uh, but first, I'd like to say congratulations to the recipients of the, such uh, prestigious awards. I mean, uh, for being involved in the level of commitment that you've given uh, to the city of Malibu, which is actually greater than just the city of Malibu, it's uh, for all public safety and the amount of people that you touch is uh, pretty phenomenal. And the Los Angeles County Fire Department appreciates your participation and your cooperation and your teamwork with the public safety endeavor. So thank you very much. So moving on to Zone Haven, um, starting with the zones that Malibu incorporated uh, several years ago that we worked on that project, this Zone Haven or Zone concept has got really large. So um, Battalion 5, uh, which you are within, um, is the pilot uh, for Zone Haven and it has a lot of benefit uh, to public safety in all risk emergencies. So with the Office of Emergency Management, the Sheriff's Department, your Los Angeles County Fire Department, and the contract with Zone Haven and their platform Zone Haven Aware gives us flexibility in all risk emergencies. I know that we're talking wildfire and evacuation in zones, but it's actually more than that. It gives us geographic reference in areas for emergencies and gives direction for not just your first responders, because we can use it in a lot of different ways in the public view, 
And um, it's really going to be a very uh, helpful tool for those geographic boundaries and isolating risk or coming up and making informed decisions and management action points based upon an all risk emergency and especially for wildfire. So what I'd like to do is have Megan go through some of the functionality of Zone Haven, and then we can do some question and answer on Zone Haven um, um, with that. So I feel that you'll be uh, highly informed and uh, highly complimentary to what the benefit this brings uh, the community. Thanks, Chief Smith. Um, if we could go to the next slide. So uh, to start off, these are the current uh, emergency evacuation zones in the city of Malibu. Um, one point I wanted to highlight, Chief Smith already mentioned this, but these zones are virtually identical to the zones that already existed in Malibu that were created a couple years back. Um, we had worked with the city of Malibu um, to create these zones and, and make them effective. So there was no real reason to change any of the boundaries. The only real difference in the Malibu zones is the zone identifier, zone identifier which is the names. Um, and those were only changed to incorporate these zones into the larger regional Santa Monica Mountains map. Um, so the way the naming system works now is that they designate the general location, which is the MAL, which stands for Malibu. And then the C is for city. So basically it, it designates whether it's a city or an unincorporated area. And then there's a continuous numbering system around the Santa Monica Mountains region. So um, the Malibu zone numbers were originally 11 through 14. So we tried to keep the spirit of that original numbering system by um, having the numbers be 111 through 114. Um, so now onto the ways that the residents in the community can use this tool. You go to the next slide. Basically on the community side, um, this will really benefit residents because they, they'll be able to see um, evacuation information and evacuation orders or warnings in real time. And, and then they'll be able to determine which protective action they need to take. So if fire or law call for an evacuation order or warning, um, we'll immediately change the status of the zone on the back end. So uh, right now, if you, if you see on the right-hand side, there's a little box, it says status normal. If there was an evacuation order, an evacuation warning called for, that would say evacuation order or warning and the, the color of the zone would be different. It would be red um, if there was an order. So, when we do change the status, we also have um, a system set up so that an, an alert will be sent out via alert LA County. And then we also have a system set up to um, notify the cities to send out their own um, city notifications to build redundancy in our, in our alerts and notifications. Um, basically puts everybody on the same page so that uh, we can communicate more clearly during the population or um, just to make sure that everyone knows what they need to do during an incident and no one feels like they're in the dark. Um, so the way that it works, you can see on the screen right now in the, in the upper left corner, there's an uh, address bar. I entered the address of Fire Station 70, which is 3970 Carbon Canyon Road. And then when you enter your address in there, it'll uh, a location pin will pop up on the map and then your zone will be highlighted and the box on the right will show you your zone number and other pertinent information about your zone. Basically, what you want to do is write down your zone identifier and place it somewhere that you'll see it, like the refrigerator or near your door, um, and then bookmark this URL, community.zonehaven.com, in your browser or your phone so you can reference it in the future. And then um, you'll also see there's a large red arrow on the screen. In the, in the information box next to your zone, it says subscribe to alerts. If you click that box, it will take you to another page, which is on the next slide, where you can register for Alert LA County. And then on the next slide, which is further down the page, it also lists each individual city and their um, city notification systems. So when you go into Zone, uh, zone Haven Aware, which is community.zonehaven.com, and you find out your zone, um, you make note of that, and then go click on Subscribe to Alerts and make sure that you're signed up for Alert LA County and the city notifications. Um, and then basically this, the entire emergency evacuation zone system and zone haven platform basically is one place to, um, gather all of our alerts and notification systems. 
and like I said, trying to build res redundancy in those so that everyone is informed and aware during um, incidents. And that's pretty much all I have, unless anybody has any questions for me or Chief Smith on the emergency evacuation zones. I have so I'd like uh, to follow up on a few things. So I see Steve has a question. Mr. Uring, you're most muted. Keep muting myself so I don't make noise. Uh, I'm just trying to understand how this works. So if there's a fire, how do I use this evacuation? I mean, I assume that someone's going to notify me that we've got to evacuate. Do I have to go to this thing to find that out? Or if I go to this thing, what does it tell me that I don't know already? I'm just, I'm Let just me give you a little like a flow chart. I'm right? just trying to get my head around whatever <laughs> we're doing here. Okay, okay, so basically this tool will only be used in major fires that require evacuations. It won't be activated during every small fire, but if there is a large fire that requires evacuations, we will, the, the initial incident attack commander who, who would be the battalion chief on scene would let our dispatch know they'll change the status of the zone that needs to be evacuated and then that would trigger the alert la county alerts going out and the city notifications going out um, so you don't need to go to this website to get the information it will be sent out via a number of different ways but once you hear that there's an evacuation you can go to community.zonehaven.com and look at your address and see if you need to evacuate or not. It's basically just a clarification tool and it's a, it's just a, um, like I said, a, like a conglomeration of information in one place. Sounds like it's more like a background tool for you guys to use to identify where the evacuation should take place and having identified that in this map, we'll get notified somehow with some emergency results from the city, right? Is that I would say that's correct, yes. Okay, cool. But it's basically just a way for community members to be able to get the information gotcha. um, in real time. I, I appreciate I've just, you did good. So Thank one, you very much. One other <laughs> benefit this, this has is you're thinking right now that you're at your house and you have to look at this zone. If you, let's say that you're out of town on a vacation and you're watching the national news and there's a fire in Malibu, you can be remote and look at your zone to see if there's any gravity behind what's going on. It's not an, a, a site specific information platform. There's plenty of places for that, but this just a couple things gives us geographic areas of reference. The versatility of this for us to use a QR code to send the QR code for incoming resources to put resources in a certain area, we can assign them to different zones, what's in the incident command structure um, for this information to be shared, to have clarity if we need to brief. It, it, this has pre-designated zones of geographic reference, so people don't have to imagine, wonder, or potentially um, look at something that, that if we say east of, west of, north of, south of, you have to then bring your own frame of reference to what we're talking about, where we can talk about the zones and how they're in a chronological order with three letter designators to identify those zones. So it just gives clarity. So it's, there's a lot of versatility to this um, to help um, in the emergency need. I see a few more hands up for questions. Bruce, I believe you're next. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that presentation. Um, does this tool um, provide a, a any kind of roadmap for the way in which somebody's supposed to evacuate? In other words, use Malibu Canyon, use uh, PCH, go north, go south. Um, and if not, is is there a tool that's, that, that does exist or that's being developed that will do that? So on, on evacuation, so we have the ability to populate language within the zones and give direction. We can populate that for if there's something. So one thing that I always talk about is evacuations and we have to be flexible because it's all based upon the point of origin, the path that it's taking versus time. And we don't want people to evacuate towards the head of the fire or cross its path. So with us setting up 
the best travel plan on evacuations when we're with law to facilitate that. Yes, it can be populated within, within um, some frame of reference. We have that ability to do so, yes. And okay, thank you, because I, I, I think that would be very helpful. I mean, when Woolsey Fire, by way of example, and it's, it's anecdotal because it's one example, but you know, I think pretty much everyone knew to leave. People just didn't necessarily know which way to go. So we will be able to, as Chief Smith said, um, put that information into the information box on Zone Haven, but that information will also be conveyed through the messaging that we send out via Alert LA County and the other um, alerting system. So it will be sent out in multiple different ways. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, another thing that I've noticed that I think will be very helpful is we've all at various times turned on the radio or the TV and had the poor person who's working for the television or radio station give absolutely improper instructions about where the fire is and, and how to get out and, and where people should be going. And for them to have a tool that they can look at and see what's actually being recommended, not what somebody told them you know, three minutes ago, it, it will be very good and hopefully we will have a more uh, unified and coherent uh, communication with the public as a result of that. And I appreciate what you're doing to make that happen. And uh, thank you. Very welcome. You. And I'm glad that you've uh, extended what we're doing out to the rest of LA, LA County. So. I think, as you mentioned, it will be very helpful for the media and also for city staff to be able to, to direct residents to one place to get um, the correct information. So I think it will be very helpful. Agreed. So thank you both. You're welcome. Thank you for the support. Okay. All right. We are now going to move on once again to the to written and oral communications from the public. So 2A is communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction. Do we have any public speakers? Yes, we have four speakers signed up. They are Blake Megdal, Taylor Megdal, Elliot Megdal, and Craig Hill. I don't see Blake Megdal in the meeting, but he might be on one of the other accounts. We'll hear from Taylor Megdal first. Hi, right, Taylor, are you available? I am, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good, sir. I'm fine. I'm sure we're all good. All right. So I, I guess I just wanted to um, call in and participate um, and discuss the matter involving the Malibu Road, um, you know, um, camping ground and bathroom location installations. And, I, and I'm pretty sure the Malibu City Council is recommending uh, disapproval, but I also just want to make my opinion heard that I think for security reasons, for cleanliness, for um, safety, and for just in general public goodwill and our community, this is just the wrong idea at the wrong time. I think it's the wrong idea, period, but given kind of the volatile societal issues with homelessness and, um, you know, I would say some of the societal kind of trends out there, I just think this is the most tone deaf concept, you know, in front of our community. And I just wanted to make sure I added my two cents, um, you know, to that conversation. Thank you, Taylor. And, and uh... As I'm thinking about what you were saying, I think that you were referring to uh, item 6B, maybe, which is on the agenda, and I should have redirected you. I apologize. So, uh, who else do we have? Our next speaker is Elliot Megdal, followed by Ryan, or sorry, followed by Craig Hill and Ryan. Could, could we ask if the other comments are going to be regarding 6B? Yes, we can. Elliot, are you planning on talking about 6B, which would be the city response letter to notice of preparation of an environmental impact report for the Malibu lower cost accommodations public works plan by the MRCA? Elliot, you should see a pop-up ask you to unmute so you can respond. If 
if Elliot doesn't see the pop up or is unavailable, we can try circling back to them and we can. How about now? We can, we can hear, hear you. you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. <laughs> uh, yes, I am uh, here to discuss the uh, the proposed uh, installation of the traffic uh, of the of the bathroom facilities and the and the and the site. So let's defer to the till it gets to that. Thank you, Elliot. That's item six B on the agenda. Thank I will make sure you're signed up for that item. Our Thank next you. speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Ryan. Hi, Craig. Here I am. Good evening, council and staff and everybody. Um, three different things. One, at the bottom of Cane and Dune, I, I can recall three fa fatal accidents there. Can imagine I might be forgetting another few. One of you suggested it seems that everything's been tried with the arrestor bed and the signage and everything. And not to say that, that there might be something more that could be done there or better, but what about crash barrels at the bottom of across the highway against the embankment? the kind that protects sharp edges along freeways. I think Rob will know what I'm talking about. They can be filled with water or other materials. And then at least if we did have more runaways, they'd be more likely to produce injury accidents than fatalities. And maybe some of the PCH funding could cover that. Next, several companies have sent out mailers advertising installation of landscape lighting. Yes, you can have lights on your house over the holidays. But landscape lighting is prohibited generally, and the problem is that once it's installed, people will leave it and still use it year round. So council, you might like to ask staff to contact companies and clarify to them that landscape lighting could lead to a fine. Um, I've saved a few of the mailers so you could contact me for the company's contact details. Finally, I recently ordered a coffee in a shop on Abbott Kinney where it turned out they have a no cash policy. And a bit of research shows that more places are going cash free. And I don't know whether or how much this has been tested in the courts, but the number of cash only citizens is all over the map. Um, and reliable numbers for LA County suggest that one in 10 adults in the county don't have a bank account. And there's a racial aspect to it where three or 4% among whites don't have an account, whereas 20 plus percent among each of black and Hispanic don't have bank accounts. So implicitly, no cash policies are racist, at least uh, in, you know, given that we don't have economic parity in this country. And some countries seem to be doing fine with no cash policies in Europe and Australia, but they have social safety nets. So it may be that they don't have the proportions of bankless individuals. I'm not sure about that part, but you, you might like to consider a declarative ordinance or perhaps something like your council, uh, your climate emergency declaration affirming that retail established must accept cash. After all, the paper money does say on it, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Um, so let's just make sure our retailers don't forget about some of the people we have in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is Ryan, and then we have a raised hand from the public. Hi, Ryan. Yes, I wanted to ask the, um, the council to direct the city manager to look into the hiring of a part-time grants writer to apply for grants for the city. Um, we've lost um, some key employees in several departments, uh, planning departments, uh, too busy and overwhelmed. And uh, this is grant writing is a specialty and it would take somebody who has experience to, you know, be effective at obtaining grants. And the public should know that grant writers bring in multiple times their cost in grants to cities and organizations. In particular, the California Highway Patrol has adopted regulations within Title 13. There are grants available uh, that are administered by the uh, CHP on behalf of the state. And in particular, there's um, uh, impaired driving grants, which would assist the city in having licensed driver checkpoints, for instance, and so forth. But it would bring in the tax funding that uh, came about in the Revenue and Taxation Code section 34019, in particular, the um, the cannabis tax. 
So the city is eligible, as are all cities, to you know apply for these funds. And if we're not even applying for them, we're, you're never going to get them. So the main thing is that generally the application process is once a year for these types of grants. And the past grant was uh, a, the application period was January 7th through something like the end of February. And so we should be prepared and be able to apply for that type of grant. And I don't mean to put Elizabeth Shavelson on the spot, but I think that she could probably handle this grant on short notice. But again, um, work on an RFP for a part-time grants writer for this city. And um, I thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. And Mayor, we have one more speaker, a raised hand from the public. They're in Zoom under iPhone. iPhone number, yes, I see you. Um, my name is Ryan Drexler. I'm a Malibu Road resident. Um, I just moved back to 24604. And there's a serious issue on this beach. Again, just kind of give you my background. Um, I've been in business for a long time. I've also been a reserve deputy for a long time in the state of Nevada, uh, but I split my time between Nevada and here. The beach has become a very serious problem. I've had people living in my house under construction for the past year. And above and beyond that, the people on the beach are still coming back underneath the house. Um, and I, I feel it's a serious concern for the residents on Malibu Road um, these men are very brazen. Um, they don't want to leave. Um, I've called the sheriff's department many times. And when they come here, they're, they're, they're not running IDs on people. Most of these people are drinking and they're not even breathalyzing these people. It's a serious concern. I've spoke to my neighbors and I, I think it's something that we need to come in and talk about because um, I don't see I don't see any deputies um, really uh, looking at the beach at night or, or you know, um, going along the road. And it's a very serious issue. Uh, again, um, I've been in law enforcement a long time as a reserve. Uh, I understand the things that are happening in the state of California. I'm really worried about the Malibu Road residents. A lot of the people are elderly. Um, a lot of them like to enjoy and walk on the road in the morning or at night. And the beach is getting very, very bad. Um, and I think it's a serious concern that I think we need to address as residents and um, uh, mayor. We, I'd love to come in and, and tell you what I think is going on and, and maybe some resolve, because I know a lot of the residents on the phone are very, very concerned. Um, they stress the concern, the, the, the concern to me, and it's getting worse. There, these these people are coming on the beach at night. Um, I again, I found since I've been here, I've chased three or four of them away at night, and I, I think it's a very big concern. And I'd really like to know the city of Malibu what we're doing about that. Like, it, are there any you know concerns? Are are there any um, strategies um, that I think uh, is anyone looking at? And I think it's a very big concern. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I will uh, send you my phone number via text when the meeting is over. And Mayor, our next speaker is Howard with a raised hand in Zoom. Hello, Howard with a raised hand in Zoom. You're muted, Howard. Howard, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. I am now unmuted, just like Elliot Magdal was. So. I actually, and the last speaker Ryan was talking about, I live adjacent to a public access that at night gets closed and the gate is supposed to lock, and which it does. And I've had conversations with the county on numerous occasions to make sure that the lock is operative. And at night when I come home, I go over there after they've picked up the track and I make sure that the gate is closed. But I will tell you, that that's a real concern. I put ring cameras on my house. I've actually got a light that now shines on that access. And people, when they walk down, that light will shine. They know somebody's there. That's what I'm doing. But I gotta tell you, I absolutely agree with what Ryan is saying. There is no control over anything that's happening on the sand at night. 
Somebody comes under your house and lights a fire to keep warm, burns your house down. That's very important. Um, uh, I will speak about fires later because I'm part of the, the uh, speaking of the your section six thing. But this is something what Ryan said is something that really needs to be dealt with by the city. The city's dealing with some parking issues down closer to Webb Way if the car's not parked in the right direction. That's the wrong focus for me. Focus for me is safety. I will now yield my time. Thank you, Howard. And Mayor, circling back to the speaker we missed earlier, Blake Megdal has joined the meeting and I'll ask him to unmute to see if he has a comment for an item not on the agenda. Okay. Blake, are you available? Yes, hi, it's Blake Magdal, and I am um, Elliot Magdal's son at 24612 Malibu Road. And I just want to, I want to tell um, the council that I am in agreement with both Howard Bernstein and my father that, um, that Malibu Road is becoming problematic from a safety perspective. And um, we all are here and, and, and wanting solutions, pragmatic solutions. Um, to help it become more safe uh, going forward, so. Thank you, Blake. And Mayor, that concludes public comment. Very good. Okay, do we have any commission or committee updates? Yes, we have Scott Dietrich here to give a commission update. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, first, and congratulations, Chris Frost, with whom I serve on the homeless task force. You will be getting a report from us after our next meeting. But since we've heard a number of people on Malibu Road talking about uh, safety and the homeless, um, this has been uh, a topic of discussion, um, not only in the homeless task force, but um, it seems in public safety and public works that the homeless issue seems to have transitioned, um, which is a good thing because we've been largely successful with the ordinances that you guys have passed uh, to prevent overnight camping in high fire zones. But the problem has shifted and it has shifted to motor homeless. People are in their cars. And if you go out with Chris at 3 a.m. in the morning, you'll see how many cars and RVs are parked uh, with people sleeping in them. And it's all over the place in Malibu. Um, and there seems to be a lack of enforcement by LASD. Um, we're hoping we have either uh, uh, Captain C2, Lieutenant Carver, um, at our next meeting to further discuss it. But, but this seems to be an overriding issue that LASD, the deputies just are not enforcing um, our parking ordinances. We know they're not the best because of the coastal commission limitations, but I urge the council to address this issue and uh, we, we need to do something about this, that we just cannot have people sleeping all over the place in cars. And unfortunately, a lot of these people communicate on social media and they know Malibu is more or less a free zone. So I'm gonna urge the council to start looking into this and see what we could do. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Do we have any other uh, commission or committee updates? No, no other commission or committee updates. City Manager McClary, will you give your update, please? Yes, thank you and good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, happy to report that uh, we've made some progress uh, in getting um, with state parks uh, and getting a ranger permanently stationed uh, at Charmley Park. Uh, it took us a while to get the agreement in place with them, uh, and we needed to make some improvements to the trailer that's on site there, uh, but that has all been completed. I'm happy to report. Uh, it will give us basically a full-time presence at the park, which, as you know, is uh, fairly remote, um, so we're happy for that added security and happy for the arrangement. 
uh, and I want to thank the community services staff for their uh, work on putting this together. Also want to report to council um, regarding uh, our, our ongoing efforts um, with Camp Kilpatrick uh, and the county's plans to uh, transfer um, the serious youth track um, youth offenders to that location. Uh, the city, we did submit a letter last week to the county uh, that detailed um, a number of public safety, uh, especially concerns related to wildfire uh, that was put together by um, a, a fire safety excerpt that the uh, city has hired uh, to work with us on this. Uh, so we did submit that letter um, last week to the county uh, and we're continuing to uh, to to press forward uh, on that, uh, you know, with, with, with continuing to, to push our concerns there and see if we can get some concessions. Uh, also, um, regarding um, our efforts to um, continue, continue to oppose the uh, low impact camping in environmentally sensitive habitat areas, uh, last Tuesday, the city was represented by Deputy City Manager Elizabeth Shabelson. Uh, we also submitted comments uh, and Liz spoke at the Board of Supervisors meeting, again, urging them to not take this action uh, on this amendment. Unfortunately, the board uh, did approve that. Um, city staff is continuing to monitor this. It will now go to the Coastal Commission, uh, where we understand it will need to be approved uh, by the executive director. So uh, we're keeping close tabs on that. Uh, regarding COVID, I don't have much to report there. Uh, the county briefing is tomorrow, where we expect we'll get an update on the numbers, uh, though I'm not expecting that we'll have any significant changes at this point. Uh, but of course, we will continue to monitor that as well. Also want to report that a couple of weeks ago, I did attend the meeting of the Las Virgins Malibu uh, Council of Governments and uh, happy to report that the board at that meeting allocated $86,000 in innovation grant funds uh, for three beds that the city will have access to uh, for the People's Concern Shelter. Uh, this action gives the city uh, an added tool to address homelessness. And uh, by use of the grant funds, it, it saves the city from having to, to spend those funds. So we we're happy to get that support from the COG. Also very thankful uh, for uh, not only Thanksgiving and the, the break this year, but uh, unlike last year, we did not have uh, any public safety power shut off. So very happy with that. Um, we were of course monitoring the situation as we had a couple of red flag warnings come up over the last couple of weeks. Uh, in preparation for that, we did do some uh, setup of the city's emergency operations center uh, and set up some uh, initial um, staffing uh, plans in case we needed to activate, uh, but fortunately we did not need to do so uh, and there was no PSPS activated. So happy for that and also happy to see that there's a little bit of rain uh, forecast for later this week. Also wanted to note that um, next city council meeting will be December 12th and of course we'll be seating uh, the new members of the city council at that time. And we'll also be uh, electing a new uh, council. We'll also be electing a new mayor and mayor pro tem at that meeting. Uh, then lastly, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Dustin Carr for a report from the Sheriff's Department. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Steve. Lieutenant Carr. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. Um, I gave the full crime report at the last meeting, just be based on the dates, all the information was available. So uh, my update this evening will be a little more brief. However, I did want to address a couple of things. First of all, is the, um, I heard some comments on the parking issue. The uh, ordinances are being enforced and we have the numbers to prove it. Um, the gen the uh, patrol units uh, in the last couple of weeks, that includes the holiday weekend, have, it, since the last city council meeting, have issued an additional 134 citations, parking citations. 34 of those have been oversized vehicles, which includes the RVs, the campers, things like that. So we are doing strict enforcement along Pacific Coast Highway. As a matter of fact, uh, I have uh, a sergeant went down to survey everything, make contacts with some of the people that are sleeping in their cars. And they've even noted and commented that they are leaving because they don't want any more parking tickets. 
So this is something we are addressing and we are being very proactive on it and we will continue to do so. Uh, with things like this, results do take time, but we are on it and we are addressing it. And I want the public to know that that these laws are being enforced and uh, we are working on it. Um, I know on the 14th, uh, which was the day of the last city council meeting, we had that fatal collision on Canaan and PCH. Uh, that was really a tragic situation there. Um, I was able to uh, to speak to one of the people involved in everything and, and they're recovering well and are in, in high spirits. And I really appreciate them and their family. I don't want to name names or anything like that. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know uh, that regarding that. Um, we've been doing additional patrol checks at Bluffs Park, especially at night. It appears that that overnight parking plug, the last report I got, which was this morning, is that overnight parking problem has cleared out. Uh, but we will continue to do additional patrol checks. And also, I also noted that the, we people were having some issues with people drinking outside Legacy Park. Um, I believe it was Saturday we arrested somebody for drinking in public there, and we're going to continue to do enforcement there as well. Keep that park nice, safe, and clean for the public. Um, I want to remind everybody uh, regarding bur residential burglaries, uh, please uh, lock your, if you keep valuables at your home, lock them up in a quality safe um, and uh, and lock your doors and, when, and things like night and don't leave valuables in your vehicle. Those are just some some general rules. They're not just for the holidays. They're for they're for all year long, um, and to help avoid uh, some criminality. So with that, um, I'm available for anybody's questions. I have I have one. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the news is reporting that there was a a uh, motorcyclist with no helmet who was in an accident at. Uh, Cross Creek and PCH a few nights ago. And, uh, you know, I don't see motorcyclists without helmets very often in California. And uh, I'm wondering if this is actually true. Or I haven't heard anything like that, but I'd be happy to follow up on that for you. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Thank awesome. you. My pleasure. Okay, we're up to city council subcommittee reports and mayor and council member meeting attendance reports and inquiries. Who would like to go first? Karen? Thank you, Paul. Uh, let's see, I just wanna uh, comment on a couple of the public comments on items not on the agenda. Regarding the no cash policy of some establishments, um, I'm sure there is a demographic disparity. There's no question in my mind about that. But I will say that last week I visited a national park and was going to pay cash to enter because I had forgotten I had a, a, a pass, an annual pass. Um, and the park ranger at the booth informed us that she was not allowed to take cash because there had been holdups at the entrance booth at this national park. So if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. And I think that's part of the reason some establishments don't take cash. They are trying to protect their staff. So, you know, that's a mixed bag and maybe something the council will think about in the future. Um, this is my last voting meeting along with Mikey's. So I wish everybody a lot of fun and interesting times in the future. Uh, yeah, we have one more meeting, but that's the transition. Uh, I will say about the red flag warnings, I'm really glad they're over for the moment and we've got some rain coming later in the week, but I do wanna thank the city manager, all the city staff uh, for having the EOC established and ready to activate. Um, I wanna thank everybody who kept us safe and prepared uh, from the fire department to the sheriff's department, uh, those doing arson watch such as Mikey, uh, and I'm sure many others. Um, and yes, we had no PSPS this year and we had no um, people scrambling to figure out how to cook their Thanksgiving dinner like we did last year. So that was great. 
Um, as far as meeting attendance, uh, I attended the COG meeting on November 15th, uh, my last meeting presiding as president. And uh, as the city manager said at that meeting, uh, the city's proposal, it's uh, consent item 3B6 tonight, uh, the proposal to have three interim shelter beds at a location in Santa Monica through the people concern is now going to be funded through LA County Measure H. And um, the, the Board of Governors of the Las Virginas Malibu Council of Government approved that unanimously. So uh, that's that was a great thing, I think, uh, $86,000 that the city can keep and use for something else. Um, and I had my final uh, county library commission meeting on the 16th, and that's it for my report. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Karen. Mr. Uring. Thank you, Paul. I've got, first, I'd like to thank whoever the people were that prayed to the wind gods over Thanksgiving to stop the winds. I mean, they were predicting some very high, or strong sand and never showed up. So thank you for that. Uh, my, my report's good. What I did over the last week is over Thanksgiving, I cooked the turkey roulade. I had friends over, we ate, we had a good time. I spent the rest of the week talking to friends that I went to high school with and friends that I went to college with. So it was just a very enjoyable week. So I thank everybody for the lack of problems that we had. We had to deal with on that. Uh, but I, it was it was an enjoyable Thanksgiving. Um, the only other thing I want to mention tonight is, uh, you know, Thanksgiving's over and Christmas is on the way. Uh, and ho, 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 uh, what we've got coming in front of us are 12 days of Christmas at the Adamson House. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to have friends over for the Christmas holidays. I assume that after, you know, three or four days of sitting around looking at each other, you're going to wonder what the heck you should do. Let me suggest that the Adamson House is having a, a series of tours that run every half an hour starting at 11 a.m. in the morning to 2.30 in the afternoon. And if you've never been to the Adamson House, it is a absolute treat. It's it's a tour back in history. Uh, and it, it's an institution in Malibu, so I encourage everybody, if you've never done that, to take some time out or visit the Adamson House. The tours run, I think it's $25 for an adult, $10 for children. Uh, if you go there, you get a, you get a, you get some brunch, you get a free gift at the uh, center. So please, if you've got if you got a chance over the holiday weekends, over Christmas, go to the Adamson House. Please visit them. They could use your help, and it really will give you a perspective of what's been going on in Melbourne. So, Paul, thanks very much. Back to you. Thank you, Steve. Mikey. Steve, good reminder on the Adamson House and. Uh, I was out on Arson Watch and uh, third on Thanksgiving, and just just to add context, was, I believe at the time because it was later in the day, and luckily we had a very late Thanksgiving. Um, I was the only person west of Canaan. It was incredibly windy in pockets, like blowing dirt and rocks. I spent a lot of time removing rocks this big from Mulholland and Ensignal, and then uh, participated in a full highway stop near near Decker on PCH because it looked like a shed or some sort of building blew onto the highway and came apart in a thousand pieces. And nice to say tourists and locals alike pulled over about five or six of us stopped the highway and removed it. So we got a little bit lucky there. And But it does bring up the interesting thought of interesting there was no potential PSPS. And I scratched my head a little bit and my only assumption and maybe Mr. McClary can bring some, you know, additional info to this is that they have finished upgrading uh, the Cuthbert circuit enough that they're not worried about strong winds like they were previously. I know they had a couple of emergency uh, repairs and upgrades they wanted to make, but it's an absolute mystery to me because it was unbelievably windy in pockets. And uh, so very curious though, no PSPS. I know there was in Santa Clarita Valley. so. Uh, um, anyhow, that's what I know there. Um, I want to first thank Karen for her tenure on the COG and as president of the COG. Thank you very much. 
You did a fantastic job. Um, really appreciate the time and effort you put into that. And um, I just wanted to make sure to thank you. I'm sorry I missed that last meeting. I wanted to come say a thank you and goodbye there, but I had my own meetings going at the same time. So thank you very much. And also, I want to thank uh, Paul and just add that he is an Arson Watch member, too, and has been very involved. And I appreciate that very much on that front, Mayor. Uh, well done. As to the speakers, I want to thank each and every speaker. Um, the people talking about public safety. It, it's When you're on council, at least to me over the last four years, it feels like whack-a-mole. You, you sort of make progress in one area and something else gets worse. And it's tricky. We are not, we don't have police authority ourselves at the city. So we have to work with the sheriff and they're under a lot of constraints. There's ever so many laws around the whole issue dealing with crime and homelessness and mental illness and all of that. But if you don't speak and tell us what you're experiencing, we won't magically know necessarily. So Thank you very much for that. Always be, um, if those speakers are still here and anyone else, a great way, if you're seeing something we should know, send an email because emails can be really nicely forwarded in your words to the appropriate person to act on it. I find that to be a good method for me rather than me interpolating what you're telling me and getting it wrong. So, um, and there's some residents in Malibu who do a fantastic job of that maybe one or two, too fantastic, but nonetheless, too much information is better than not enough. And um, I appreciate that very much. Um, and yes, the public safety issues are ever ongoing and um, ever changing. So uh, thank you for that. Craig Hill, um, yeah, the fatal bottom of Canaan this time was not the normal crash, but nonetheless, interesting idea on the barriers across the road. I never thought of that. Of course, to be a big project to build the retaining walls and place the barrels there to try and prevent that kind of thing. But that was a horrifying accident. There's no about, doubt about it. But thinking outside the box can't hurt, I guess. Um, and the no cash thing, I've wondered about that too. So it's nice to hear someone else say it. I actually don't know everything about that, but that was interesting. Um, and um, let me check my notes quickly. And I think that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Bruce? Thanks, Paul. So, um, first of all, the, the accident that occurred at the um, base of Cannon, that that wasn't had to do with the arrest or the arrest of Ed, did it? No, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. And I don't, I don't know if Rob Dubow is here. I know that we actually focused some attention in the past year to eighteen months on that arrest or bed because a number of cars were inadvertently going into it. Not 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 vehicles that it, that weren't effectively using it, but cars that were inadvertently going into it. And I know some work was done, and it's much more prominent now. I have not heard of cars being stuck or inadvertently using it. Is that still going on? Does can, is Rob here? Can he tell us, or does anyone? Rob is there. He's ready for you. Yeah, I, I think ever since we changed out and did those uh, striping improvements and all that kind of stuff, it has dropped off significantly. And then also contacting Google and Waze and everything to get the, the mapping uh, down correct is what is what was found that is that. Um, those mapping and G GPS were having having people turn left earlier than they're supposed to, so people were going in. Um, I think there was one person that turned in that um, came from the apartments and was trying to turn left instead of turning right. And um, but that's that's the only one that I've heard of. Thank you, Rob. And and I'd forgotten about you catching that GPS thing. That was a, that was a good catch because yeah. that's amazing to me. Um, on the the other the public comments, I I think that the common theme tonight, even the people that prematurely spoke about the um, later item, is public safety, um, and the public comments were about the unhoused population problem, which has significant, which has decreased. I don't know if it's been significant, but it's decreased. Um, but it's obviously still an issue, and it's never going to not be an issue. But you know, we we spent. A lot of time a year ago working out an ordinance that would constitution, we, we believe um, in a constitutional manner, 
um, give us a lot of leverage for dealing with that subject. And I, I'm very disappointed because it, it still seems to not be being understood or enforced by the Sheriff's Department. Um, Captain Becerra, Lieutenant Braden, and, and, and the Sheriff to some extent um, were on board when we first adopted it and we're working. It's, see, this is not a parking issue. It's a, it, you just cannot sleep in your vehicle on the side of the road or anywhere for that matter in Malibu that you are technically camping and that violates our no camping ordinance. And um, you don't need to be illegally parked. You don't need to be parked for too long. You just aren't allowed to be sleeping in your vehicle or sleeping on the beach or camping out on the beach. So it, we need to set up a meeting and do something to get this um, on the radar of the Sheriff's Department again. And if necessary, perhaps um, have a discussion with the County Council because um, we said we, we spent a lot of time, we put a lot of effort into adopting this ordinance. Mikey and I worked with um, Trevor and, and John Cotty, and I think we've got a constitutionally sound ordinance. We've set aside certain spaces. They're limited, but they exist where people are allowed to do that if they otherwise have no place to be. And um, that means, though, that 90% plus of the space is off limits, and that's permissible. I'm really encouraged to hear about these three beds. I had not known that we, we secured that. So K Karen, thank you for whatever work you did that, that contributed to that. By the way, you do have one more meeting you have to vote at. It's a silly thing, but we have a meeting before we do the, the turnaround. So um, ultimate lame duck meeting, but we do have one more meeting in which we, we all vote before we um, have a new council. Um, you know, look, I like Steve, I, I spent time prepping for the holiday and enjoying the holiday and um, full of gratitude right now. So um, I, I hope everyone else out there had a great uh, holiday and appreciates how great a life we have here. Um, we're blessed and, um, you know, the problems we have are nothing compared to the problems many people have in many other places. Uh, so um, let's let that sink in and, and, and uh, glow in it. So oh, back to you, Paul. Okay, well, I, there weren't a lot of meetings for me the last couple of weeks, but I did get to spend an evening of arson watch, uh, not Thanksgiving Day, thank God. On Thanksgiving Day uh, and the day before, I had two of our kids and two of our grandkids and spouses and made a big turkey and... Uh, made enough so that I'm now averaging a minimum of two turkey sandwiches a day. I don't know how long I can keep this up, but I'm gonna keep trying as long as possible. Uh, the, uh, and I really appreciate the fact that we are going forward. I'm looking forward to going to uh, the uh, swearing in of uh, Sheriff Luna. So we will be in a position to talk to him about things that will be coming up soon. And uh, no, I, I hope that, uh, I hope this is, that our future relationships with the supervisors and the sheriff is even more improved than it has been already. Okay. And I believe that will bring us to the consent calendar. Now, does anyone want to pull anything from, has the public pulled anything from the consent calendar? Item number 3B4 has been pulled by the public. 3B4? Yes. Okay. And would anyone, any member of the council like to pull something from the consent calendar? Bruce, I see your hand. Yes, I'd like to pull 3B6, please. 3B6. Any, uh, Mr. Urine, I see your hand. 3B8. 3B8. What is it? Do you have something against odd numbers? <laughs> 3B8. Okay. Uh, I could make a motion then to approve the consent calendar except for 3B4, 3B6, and 3B8. I'll second. So you have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar with the exception of items 3B4, 3B6, and 3B8. So, can we call the roll, please? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. 
Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. That brings us to item 3B4. And item 3B4 is uh, findings to hold virtual city council, commission, committee, board, and other city body meetings under AB 361. Who has pulled this item, please? We have one speaker from the public, Norm Haney, and we can hear from him now. Mr. Haney, are you available? Uh, yes, I am, uh, Chair uh, Grisante. Um, you know, I've spoken to this uh, situation before, but I think that the uh, communication between applicants uh, and commissioners and uh, staff members uh, basically is much, much better when it's in person. And that, that is not to say that we can't also do Zoom. Now, I, in the last year, I've attended most of the Coastal Commission hearings, um, and they have a combination of Zoom. Uh, many of the staff members Zoom in. They don't, they don't drive to the meetings. The last one was in Salinas, a five-hour drive from here. Um, cost you $120 just to get there in gas. But, um, but they also have in-person communication. And I see the value in both of those. I just don't understand why, if the Coastal Commission can do it on a regular basis, why the city can't do it, why the city refuses um, to do it. And, and uh, you know, here in Malibu, where everybody is in the same place, and many people can go to the meeting and actually have an opportunity, the... Uh, the, the individual council members or uh, planning commissioners, they can sit at the dais. They're separated by a uh, plastic um, uh, guard, and they're 20 feet away from the people that are at the microphone. Um, so I'm going to take another shot at saying I'd like to have in-person meetings along with the Zoom. And having said that, um, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. Mayor, we have another yes speaker, Don Schmitz. Mr. Schmitz, are you available? I am. Thanks for unmuting me. Yes, I'd just like to echo the sentiments of Mr. Haney, and I would urge the council to uh, seriously consider uh, once again having hearings in person. It's becoming the norm. Uh, having uh, our meetings remotely was a necessary evil. And thank God, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, we had this amazing technology and we fumbled along and we've gotten pretty good at it. But the reality is, as human beings, our communication is both verbal and nonverbal. And I think all of us uh, assess a lot of the communication that we engage in with the body language and looking each other in the eyes. Uh, clearly, the technology is there. Uh, uh, Mr. Haney is completely correct that the Coastal Commission has a blending of both in-person and uh, in remote access. And for an agency that is uh, cons has constituents all up and down the state of California, maintaining that remote access is hugely important. And it can be hugely important for a small city such as ourselves uh, to really maximize public participation. Uh, but that being said, uh, you were just commenting in regards to the hurricane force winds. We dodged some bullets in regards to power outages uh, and, and planned power outages not transpiring, but there's been several hearings which have been disrupted uh, pursuant to there being a power outage in the city. And the planning commission hearing uh, last week was delayed by a half an hour because there was a notification, I believe it was, on, uh, on the YouTube uh, aspect, and they were worried that certain folks would not be able to participate because they couldn't monitor the hearing. It's problematic. We're putting all our eggs in that one basket. So uh, we've done a real good job as a community to continue to do the people's business with the remote access, but the time has definitely come for us to uh, uh, reacquaint ourselves with that human touch, be in the same room, and have those, uh, those public hearings in person. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Schmitz. And Mayor, that concludes public comment. I see Mike Eden Pearson's hand. I think actually Bruce was first if you want cigar to. I'm um, sorry. Bruce, Bruce I'm sorry. Draw. Go ahead, Mike. 
<laughs> I was just going to say, I think the new council has, uh, the two new councilors have broad, uh, loudly and clearly said that uh, they plan on bringing that forward. And so, uh, you know, I suspect that time is coming. Um, yeah, maybe Norm and Don actually missed a meeting. That seems very unlikely, but it must be possible because uh, it was definitely discussed last meeting. And uh, and I guess I won't opine on how I would vote because it just doesn't matter. That's it. Thanks. Thank and, you, Mike. And with, with that, I'll make a motion to approve this item. And I know Bruce still has comments. Bruce? Well, I'll, sec I'll second the motion. Uh, my comments are actually, I, I know Norm did not meet, miss the meeting because his comments last week, I, he could have just recorded them and pressed play for this week. I think they were pretty much identical. Um, you know, oh, first of all, um, Don, uh, I, congratulations on the new addition to your family. I think I saw that on social media and I, I meant to congratulate you before. So congratulations publicly to that. Um, you know, we had one live meeting during the two years that I've been on council now, and, and it was great. It really was a great live meeting. It was, I think it was during that interim period where we were all led to believe after getting our second shot that things were safe before we were told a couple weeks later, no, they're not. Um, so it's clearly a, a superior um, way to conduct a meeting. It's the way we've been, people, it's the way human beings have done it for thousands of years. Um, Nonetheless, we do continue to live in a pandemic. And uh, at a bare minimum for right now, I'm gonna support continuing to do this the way we're doing it. Um, I suspect that I may be in the minority and be outvoted in a couple of weeks when we have a new council and we'll vote to bring it to, bring, to come back live. But you know, the body language and facial, um, being able to see someone's face, I couldn't agree more. You know, I've been advocating since before I was elected and since the first meeting in which I joined the council that it is absurd that we have the cameras turned off for members of the public. And that's one easy way to accomplish a large portion of the absence of that con of that part of the contact. So, um, you know, it's, it's not it's not this or that. There's 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 other op op alternatives. And once again, I just have to say it, it, it amazes me how this tends to break down on political grounds i mean it, it, i know who i know where people i know where people are politically on the um spectrum and people on the one side politically are the ones that are advocating live meetings and people that are on the other side politically are the ones that want to play it safe and continue to um take care of themselves and you know it is not optimum but we don't live in an optimum time i mean i would have loved to have not had to deal with the last two and a half years of what the world has brought us but we live in a world in which, that we live in so um, it's not a black and white clear. There's no clearly right answer, but we'll do whatever the majority determines, I guess, in a couple weeks. So those are my comments. Uh, so we have a motion and second. Mr. McClary, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to quickly uh, comment for both the council and for the public that based on prior council direction, uh, we are coming back on January 9th with a discussion item for the council uh, to discuss and give direction to, to staff on how they want to proceed going forward, on uh, whether they want to return to in-person or hybrid or whatever you would like to uh, to direct staff to do at that point. So that discussion is scheduled for January 9th. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So we're now voting on item 3B4. We have a motion and a second to approve. Uh, Kelsey, will you call the roll, please? Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Urine? Yes. Mayor Crisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Revisit on the January the 9th? Yes, okay. Okay, we're on to item 3B6, which was pulled. And is that Steve or Bruce? Steve, Bruce. Bruce. Um, I guess there's no public speaker since no member of the public pulled it. We did have a speaker sign up from Jay Trevino, but I'm not seeing him in the meeting at the moment. I, I believe he's also representing the consultant. Yeah, we had a rep from Baker Tilly that was going to be on the call if there were any questions. So um, I, I ask that this one be pulled. That this is to retain a consultant um, to evaluate how the city's performing. It, 
in the planning and safety and those that, those departments. Um, I, I we absolutely need an evaluation. We need guidance. I, I don't I don't disagree with that. Steve McClary had mentioned to me in a private meeting months ago before this became an item the thought of um, retaining a um, former city manager from another city that might be able to take a look. And, and I'll tell you, I, I like that idea way more than I like hiring professional consultants because professional consultants, they make their living constantly being hired by one city after another to do this. And they therefore have to pull their punches a little bit if they see problems because they wanna get hired by other cities. And I just don't know enough about this consultant. I also think this is something that ought to be decided by the incoming council, as opposed to dumping it on the city's plate with the outgoing council. But um, the sample report we got was from management consultants. Those were the, the, the great group that gave us the Woolsey Fire um, assessment, which I know a lot of people were dissatisfied with for the reasons I just stated. Maybe others were very happy with it, but I just, um, I'm not prepared to support this right now. If it goes forward, I'm gonna vote against it. Um, not because at the end of the day, I'll vote against it, but I just think we need to have a more robust discussion than a consent item is going to allow. And I'd like a report and more, more understanding. So that's why I asked that this be pulled. Thank you, Bruce. Now, I'll, make, I'll make a motion to, to table this one until we have a new council, to table it to a, indefinitely to a new date when we have new council. Okay, I have a motion to table. Mr. Uring? Do we have a public speaker? Let's let's close the public comment. We have we... two people oh, who raised already. their hand. Have we closed, already public... closed the public comment? Public comments closed? Okay. Uh, th then let me let me talk about this one. I, I did some research and I, did, I had some communications with the city staff regarding this organization. And it appears <clears throat> that the, the, the employees or the people who will be doing the research here in Malibu do have some experience as city managers, as other things. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little less concerned than Bruce is in terms of the, the, the quality of the people that are coming in and the results that we're gonna get from that. Uh, and I do think that this is one of the most important things we're gonna do over the next six months. I mean, if you had to pick something that is, uh, on everybody's viewpoint, this is the one, if we don't get this one right, we're gonna be in a lot of trouble for a very long time. So the, the, the question I have is, there, is who is the person here from the consulting firm? Is there somebody online that we can talk to? Yes, Mayor and Councilmember Uring, we had Jay Trevino, which is our project manager. We saw him signed on earlier. I'm not sure um, if he is still there. I don't have anyone under that name. Um, we do have an I've phone user if we'd like to check in with them and see if that may be the speaker we're looking for. I've just got a question for them if we can get a hold of somebody from the firm. And, and let me start my comments and see if you can gig somebody up. I've done this before. I've done this before from both sides. I have been part of the group that went out and did the investigation and tried to identify things to fix. And I've been on the recipient side as the uh, people who were getting the results from the consulting firm and trying to figure out how we how we deal with that and what goes on. And the one thing I've learned uh, that, that helped me get through both of those things was the process that we had some kind of scheduled meetings with the city staff or the, the person in charge from the city to identify what was going on, all right? That, that we got an idea of where they were, what they had found, uh, and, and it gave us a chance to sit back and say, are there things that they're looking at that we that we think they should ignore that and go someplace else? Or is there something they found that we think we want them to dig further into? Have they found something that they're gonna go down a rabbit hole? We don't want them to do that. So at least in my mind, it's gonna be very critical if we're gonna make this thing work, that we have some kind of scheduled meetings uh, with the city staff and I'd like to find out from the app, the whoever the guy is running this stuff, whether they plan on doing that or how they want to schedule those meetings. 
Councilmember Urania, we're trying to find uh, Jay. I know he's he's watching, but I think he's having technical difficulties logging in. But uh, at least I can respond in the interim. Um, that is part of the plan is to meet with all of the relevant stakeholders, meet with staff, meet with the community. No, I want scheduled meetings. The question I have, are there going to be scheduled meetings that these people are going to come in and tell us where their status is, what they found, where they're going, what they're going to do next? That's what I want to understand. Is that, yeah. is that in the plan? Planned meetings with us. I mean, we're we were planning on planned having a kickoff. With, planned meetings with the yeah, with the people who are in charge of managing it from the city side. Yes, who? That's what I want to know. Yes, and in fact, we were planning on having a kickoff meeting with them in a couple of weeks, um, as long as we approved the contract tonight, um, and then we would have uh, plenty of ongoing meetings internally. We'd be happy to provide updates to the council if that. No, no, no. Here's, what I, here's, here's where I'm going. I want the city council to participate in some of those meetings. I want someone from the city council to sit. I want those meetings to be scheduled so that somebody from the city council be an individual city council member, or if the next city council wants to have a, a subcommittee, I want some, this is the most important thing we're going to be doing over the next six months. And I want to make sure that the city council has got some idea of what's going on, the status of where we are, how, what kind of progress we're making, what issues we're going to deal with. So when I get to the end of this thing, I'd like to do whatever I can, whatever we have to do to make sure we've got a plan that's going to allow us to move forward. So I really want to understand how they're going to schedule these meetings, who's going to do that, how we will know when they're there, and do they have any problem having a city council sit in those things? No problem at all. In fact, that's part of the idea is that they would be sitting down, scheduling meetings with each individual council member. No, 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 not the city. You're, okay, you're, you're giving. That's not what I'm saying. I don't want individual city council members. I want when these people come up with their status. We've been doing this for three months, three weeks, four weeks, whatever it is. And here's what we found in those four weeks. Here's what we think we're going to look at over the next four weeks. I want to be involved in those meetings. How can I make sure we do that? Council member, a bit of a loss of what you're looking for. Uh, we would be providing a report uh, at the end of the Here's, process okay, and then me, get let, your engagement in that. Let and me, we would be let, implementing all let of me those be a, Let me be a little bit clear. Okay, if I'm not clear, let me know. I think having understanding what these folks are doing and making sure that we're making good progress in terms of whatever the end result is, I think is the most important thing we want to do. And I think a city council person or a subcommittee member should be involved in status meetings to say, where are we? What have we got done? Where are we going? What are we going to do next? What problems have we come up? What have we found? I mean, have we found something we can address right away and get it fixed? And, and to do that, my experience has been, if we've got scheduled meetings once a month, once every three weeks, whatever it is, where they come in front of us, a group, and tell us what they've done, where they are, where they're going, it allows us to do that. And that's what I want to make sure we're going to do with this organization. Otherwise, our change, we're going to wait. I don't want to wait six months down the line to find out what the hell the answer is. If, if we can find out stuff in the short run, I think it's to our benefit to do that. So that's, I want to, are they going to schedule? They've got scheduled meetings. And if they have those scheduled meetings, when are they going to be? Or I mean, they can, Steve McClary can let us know. And is there any problem with having a city council member or two sitting in those meetings? That's what I want to know. Thank you, Steve. I, I think that what you're tending to do, Steve, is ask 14 questions. There was one question. But when is I know, the but scheduled? you ask it 14 ways and never let anybody answer. I, mean, I, I know, Paul, he's had a chance to answer. I'm looking for an answer. I think I've been fairly, relatively clear. Anybody got an answer? Yeah, May go, I, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, Councilmember Erring, I, I think I clearly understand what the ask is. I don't think that was a, something that we had anticipated. However, I think it's a very good suggestion. Uh, I don't think I have any concerns with it. I, I think what we would want to do is if that's something that council is supportive of, uh, then what would be appropriate? And Trevor, stop me at any point if I'm off here. But uh, And I don't know that council could do it at this meeting, but we could come back. Uh, with a future agenda item uh, where the council could appoint a, an, an ad hoc um, committee of two council members or less. And we could do exactly what you're asking for council member Erring. We could come up with the schedule, sit down with the, uh, with the consultant 
uh, figure out a regular uh, check-in procedure for that. Uh, and then we, we could do exactly what you're asking. We could schedule those meetings. We could have the ad hoc committee members present, staff, the consultants, and we could go over uh, where we're going, what we're hearing, uh, what we're seeing, and, and that would be an opportunity to give feedback. We're, we're already going to have a meeting where we're going to make appointments to these ad hocs. I think there's a consideration of a, the creation of, of one new ad hoc. This could be another one that could be considered at that same time. Yeah, I just, I just, I mean, it's, it, to me, it's more of a, a question as much of the city staff as to the consultant is, are they willing to do that? Is that how they interact with their client? I don't know. I mean, they're different. These, everybody's got a different approach to how they want to get there. I just want to make sure that if what Steve McClary says they're willing to do, if the consultant is willing to do that, we can set up those meetings and make sure that there is some good communication going on between the consulting group and the city council and city staff. So however we get there, if Steve, if you think you can get us there, I'll take your word for it. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, if that's if that's something council wishes to do, although you're right, I think we would need to have that conversation with the consultant, but um uh you know, but we, we could certainly have that conversation and, and see about trying to make that happen. Okay. Bruce. Well, uh maybe Steve, maybe I get a second for my motion from Steve. You know, this is part of why I want to put this off. I, I think we need to flesh it out a little better. Um I want to say I'm, one thing that gives me a lot of encouragement about this is that Joe has been um, involved in the selection process and will be working with the consultant because I've been very impressed from having been on another selection group with Joe's work in that regard. Um, I, if I understand correctly, what I'm hearing from Steve is um, I, my house is under repair from a from a major problem and every week. I have a scheduled meeting with the general contractor and the and the project manager where they provide me with an agenda for the meeting. They tell me what's happened in the last week and what's going to happen in the next week and get my approval to move on to the next step um, or refine things and move along. And I, I, if I'm hearing correctly, I think that's the kind of thing Steve's asking for is a regular project meeting of some sort built into this process so that it doesn't just go into a black box and come back to us with a report six months later. Um, Steve, did, do I understand correctly? Bruce, Bruce, you did good. Thank you very much. Sure. So, you know, it might be a good idea, even if we if we were to table this, bring it back with, with a proposal to do it one of two ways and have that built in as a city council option to approve it that way. And maybe even in connection with approving it that way, if that's the decision of the city council at that moment in time to appoint the ad hoc as well. So I just would like to see this put off and, and, and have more thought put into it. Um, that was the motion, well, Steve. I don't know if you're willing to second it. And we'll yeah, see uh, you know, I mean, if, if Steve, if, if I, and, you know, to, to follow up Bruce's motion, if we can, when it comes back to us at the next meeting, if we could get some consensus from the consultant that they're willing to do that, because I think they're the ones that are going to run the meeting, right? They, they're the ones that have to provide us with the update. So I'm willing to agree with Bruce, second his motion under the, with an amendment that says that I want them to come back next meeting with some advice from the consultant that they're willing to do that so we can figure out how the hell we're going to deal with this process. Is that okay with you, Bruce? Yeah, I think it's more detailed than necessary, but sure. Okay. The motion is then to continue this item to the next meeting, um, including a, a report from the consultant with uh, about their willingness to, um, to add uh, a, a regular meeting with an ad hoc yeah, committee. How they're going to update? How they're going to update well, in this process? Well, the, it's, it's let's not, let's it's return not. to being recognized before we speak, please. Sure. Trevor, would you like to finish your sentences? I was just trying to clarify what the motion was at this point. I believed it was to continue this item to the next meeting, and that the amendments sought by. Uh, Councilor Erring was to um, include a report about um, whether the cons whether the uh, consultant was willing or whether the the agreement was, would include a regular meeting with an ad hoc uh, committee of the city council or similar. Yeah, Trevor, it wasn't to continue to the next meeting. It was to continue to the first or second meeting of the new city council because the next meeting is going to be with the same council again, and it's a perfunctory meeting. 
Okay, what, what meeting would you like to continue to, or do you want to put it to city managers to a date uncertain the city manager can bring it back? That's the that's my preference. Is, is that okay with uh, the I'll second? Sec I'll second that. Okay, so let's continue to a date uncertain, and then um, the report up, um, about the con about the uh, consultant's um, willingness to meet with the with an ad hoc committee or similar meet, uh, grouping of the city council, and whether that's included in the agreement. Does that further reflect the motion in the second? Yes. We have a motion in the second, and we're open for discussion now. And I'd like to start it by pointing out that what we have here in front of us is a a six month process. So you're asking them for a minimum of six additional meetings. Uh, I would imagine that that's going to, and that's in addition to the meetings they're going to do with each one of us individually, each one of the council members individually. And the, I think it's, if they were going to have more meetings, I would like them to have more meetings with members of the public who have actually gotten permits. They've, they've got, the, the proposal says they're going to be 12 people that are declared by the city to be representative. I have no idea who those 12 persons or, or companies are that they're going to be meeting with, but I got to think that there's, I would have no problem coming up with 12 people who have serious opinions all by myself. And I know that the rest of us who've been getting emails from people asking for help with their problems could easily come up with at least that many as well. Uh, so that's that's my my uh, concern on this. Mikey, you're up. This is an item I wanted to see come forward since our last city manager. Um, so whether your ideas sound fine, um, Bruce and Steve, but still, I think this, this should move forward and, uh, what you want to add to it is a separate item. It seems at this point. So to me, this is a process that's long overdue that, you know, we need to make progress on. So I, I'm in favor of this item. Okay. Any other comments? Bruce, did you just leave your hand up? No, I just put it back up. Just very brief comment. Paul, I would think actually the comments you just made would suggest tabling this because you identified yet another item of the process that's unclear. So that's that's just my thought. All right. Steve, and then I will respond. Steve? Yeah, Bruce, or Paul, my, my suggestion doesn't conflict with yours at all. You're, they're going to interview the people. I'm not asking them to interview us. I just want, I, what I'm looking for are status updates from the people who are doing the work uh, so we can understand where they are. It makes sure that we're, they're staying on track. And if there's some reason we believe there should be a modification of what they're doing, we can address that in the middle of the process versus getting to the end and getting an answer we're not happy with. So it doesn't, they're going to interview the 12 people, more power to them. I'm not arguing with that. This doesn't conflict with that at all. Steve, I'm expecting them to be give us an answer that we're not going to be happy with. I'm not happy with the situation we have been in. I'm not happy with the people who call me asking me, well, can I help them get through the process more smoothly? Isn't there a, a way we could make this happen? I'm, I'm not expecting that the solution is going to be 100% favorable to all parties. I'm expecting them to be coming in from the outside and telling us what the problems are and outline some suggestions about what they think could do to make it better. And I don't expect, I don't expect everybody to get what they wanted. I mean, we'd all love to think that if we just sit here and do nothing and put things off for two months, the problem is going to magically solve itself. If we, you know, what we're talking about now is putting it off for another month until we can pick the people for the, uh, to meet with them. Well, we can pick those people to the subcommittee to meet with them and monitor their progress at any point in this, in this process. But they have to get started on the process. 
And we voted for this back when we were setting the priorities for the coming year back in June. And now we have a chance to vote to get going on it. And I'm very much in favor of getting going on it as soon as possible. And yes, we will be, have the ability to get updates on what's going on from Joe or Steve or get in, actually get invited to the meetings with staff. But, you know, we need to start this at some point. It's not gonna, you know, if we wait two months to start it or a month to start it, you know, it's just more time, more time, more complaints. Why aren't you guys doing something about this? That's my feelings on this. Mr. Uring? Paul, have you ever done this before? I have. I've done it a no, number Steve, of times. No, Steve, I've never done this before. Well, I've never ahead. consulted any consultants. Then, then I'm, I'm going to help you out, Paul. I'm going to help you out. Steve, I'm not I was being facetious. I am not, Paul, I understand. I'm not arguing about, I'm not looking for them to give me answers that I agree with. I, I, matter of fact, I'm, the reason I want the city council to participate in these things is to make sure that we're getting answers and making progress to come up with what we need to have at the end to improve this. This is probably the most important thing we're going to do over the next six months. If we don't get this right, I don't know what the hell we do after that. So, and I'm not arguing, they can, argue, they can interview all the 12 people they want to interview with. All I want is to make sure as this thing moves forward, there is a status update that they provide to members of the city council so we can make sure that we agree that we're moving in the right direction. That's all I want to have. And I want to get the consultant to agree that they're willing to do that. Thank you, Steve. Mr. Silverstein. Yeah, I, I really have a heart. If, if the comments that were just made from the mayor about we're not going to get the answers we want to hear, good answers, was what he took from what I and Steve have been saying, then we've got a failure of communication because I thought it was pretty obvious, but perhaps we're not doing a good enough job of communicating that the concern is the opposite of that. The concern is that we're gonna get some kind of whitewashed product from a professional consultation company that works for one city after another and depends on pleasing cities to get hired again to do another project. That I believe is what's happened in the past with consultants that we've hired. And what, St what Steve added to the conversation, which I thought was actually a good addition, was to involve council members in the process to, over, to watch over what's going on, because otherwise you've got the staff directing the consultants who are, criti who are critiquing the staff. Uh, so I don't know how it was perceived that this conversation is being driven towards we want to try to find a way to make sure that we get answers that everything is copacetic or hunky dory. It's the complete opposite of that. We don't actually I don't want a result one way or the other. I want what's right. Um, and I think what Steve was adding to the conversation was simply one way to help get to what's right. But in any event, um, so you know, I agree with you, Paul, 100%. We're 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 not necessarily going to be happy with the answers if, if what we're looking for is answers that say we're doing things great. Um, I actually will be happy with the answers if the answers identify problems that, and provide ways to correct those problems. Um, but I wanna make sure that they're actually going to be critically looking at what's going on and give us answers. And that's why I said I'm actually I'm actually encouraged by Joe's participation, encouraged by, by Steve McClary's participation because they're new, relatively new to this. So they don't have a um, domain to protect personally, but they also still have a staff that, that answers to them that, they're, that they feel responsible for. And I think they're gonna wanna not see people's feelings hurt. So I, I just wanna make sure this is being done in a very objective way. And I'm just not sure it's set up that way yet, which is why I made the motion. And yeah, I don't wanna put it off and put it off and put it off, but here we are today. And I don't think asking for another month is, is that much to ask. And then we'll have Doug and Mary Ann, which by the way, officially congratulations. I and mean, it's pretty obvious that we've got, we've got almost the end of the um, line here. Uh, we'll have their input too. And I mean, I, 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 I um, respect Mikey's position. I, I'm gonna respect whatever position Karen's gonna have to say, but they are on the way out and two new people are on the way in and they may agree that everything's set up fine or they may also have concerns about the way it's set up and wanna have their contributions added to this. So that's why I, I had asked that it be put off. 
Thank you, Bruce. Karen, and then we'll call this question. Uh, I did notice that Mr. Trevino had logged into the meeting. I can hold my comment until after he speaks if he wishes to. Could we please get him on? Is Mr. Trevino available? Jay, you should see a pop-up ask you to unmute. Yes, here I am. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. <clears throat> I've been listening to your conversation. We would be happy to have periodic meetings with an ad hoc committee or whomever the council would uh, would designate. Um, I can assure you that we will pull no punches in our assessment. I, I, I can understand why that is a concern. Um, we will we will, after doing a very exhaustive review and talking with um, uh, customers, stakeholders in Malibu, we will have a very clear understanding of what the problems are in your development process, and, and we will focus on recommendations that will fix those problems. Um, you may or may not like our recommendations because, quite frankly, some of them may involve resources. You may not have the technology that you need. Um, you may not have the staff that, that you need, either in certain areas. There may be organizational uh, um, uh, hurdles uh, at, that, that we encounter. Again, we, don't, we know none of these things because we haven't begun the work yet. But um, we would be happy to meet with an ad hoc committee of the council, and, uh, and, and we will provide you with a, a very candid review of uh, Malibu's development process. Thank you. Karen? Thanks, Paul. I was going to call the question. Okay. We have a motion and a second to table or delay. What was the motion, please? Is to, to continue to a date uncertain uh, when the city manager will um, bring this item back. Um, and I think we now have the answer from the, the consultant. And then, so I don't know if we need the second part, but the, the, the second part was to include uh, regular meetings. Um, with the city council members or an ad hoc committee. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to to put this off. To continue to the date uncertain. Continue to a date uncertain. May I, will you believe, be, I'm sorry, Kelsey, can you call the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Urie? Yes. Council Member Fair? No. Councilmember Pearson? No. Mayor Grisanti? No. Motion fails. Okay. Can I get a motion that we go ahead and, and start the contract with Mr. Trevino's firm? Which I'm sure is not the correct words. The, I'd like you to authorize me to execute the professional services agreement with Baker Tilly USLP for comprehensive development services review and appropriate $80,850 from general fund and designated reserve to account number 100-7003-5100-00. All second. Well, I had my hand up to make the motion, but. Sorry, I wasn't looking up. I was trying to find the, the button here to. Was that a motion from the mayor or or was that a yeah. request for a motion? It started as a request and turned into a motion. Okay. So the motion is staff's recommendation and there was a second from Council Member Pearson, I believe. And a third from Karen. Can you call the roll, Kelsey? Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Uri? No. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? No. Motion okay. carries. All right. That brings us to item number 3B8, Professional Services Agreements for Contract Planning Services. Who will be presenting? Or You don't have any speakers from the public on this item, and it was pulled by a council member. Okay. So is that you, Steve? It was me. Okay. All right. I voted for this in the uh, A and F meeting um, because I think we've got to find a way to dig ourselves out of this hole. I mean, basically, what we're doing, we're ap applying here, or allocating close to a million dollars for contract planners, in addition to some 
$500,000 we already had budgeted for contract planners and whatever that whole process goes down. Uh, and I asked Joe to give me some idea of what the delta was between what it's costing us to do these contract programmers and what it would cost us if we were hiring, you know, we had people originally hired as part of the city. And Joe, do you ever come up with an idea of what that percentage difference is? Uh, Mayor and Councilmember Uring, we provided a hourly difference. We were trying to give you a common denominator comparison of, of what the difference would be on an annual basis. Um, so what we did provide- that, What do you think that number is? What do you think the difference is, percentage difference is? Um, I, I could do the math real quickly if you want uh, on the percent difference, but for each planner level of position, it, it, there is a large significant delta um, right. there. And it, it's not definitely not the ideal to continue with contract planners. It's it's meant as a stopgap. Okay. One, and just, just as, a, as a, an aside, I'm disappointed that the city management doesn't have a good handle on what the difference is for providing contract programmers versus employees because that should be an incentive for us to get this thing fixed as quickly as we can. Because my take says the difference is, it's costing us pretty close to 50% more to hire these contractors than what it would cost us if we had our own employees, plus whatever we lose in soft costs because we lose the institutional memories and all that kind of stuff. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, we are where we are, and I think we gotta get these people in. I mean, I've got, I've got some major concerns there's something in here that says we're gonna we're gonna contract with 13 planners, and they're gonna end up being the equivalent of five planners. Some, I mean, that's some new math that I'm not really I don't understand. But okay, I'll take you guys' word for that. Uh, my major concern with all of this was how are you gonna train these people? How are we gonna bring these 13 people in, get them up to speed with what's going on in Malibu, and make sure we're getting the results that we want to get out of out of the back end. So here's my, and okay, so that, that was where I am. So here's one solution I have for trying to deal with that. One is in the staff report, it says that Richard or somebody is going to come back to it. We've got nine metrics, I think, that we've developed to identify things that Richard is tracking based on our performance. And Richard says he's going to come back to us in June or in mid year someplace with an update of where we stand with those metrics. My record, I'm going to, I'm going to vote to approve this. But what I'm going to do in addition to that is put a motion in there that says, I would like to see Richard, Joe, and Steve McClary sit down and give us some targets of where they want those metrics to look like when we get to June, right? I want them to give us some projections that says, based upon what we're doing, here's what we think we're going to end up with. And that's, and the reason I'm doing that, I've done this in business, having goals, setting goals for people is an extremely important thing. It helps us helps us achieve what we're looking to do. It gives it's a good management tool because if people come into work and they say, "What the hell am I supposed to do?" Here's your goal, pal. Go out and hit that. And the third thing it does it gives us a way to sort of evaluate the our management, right? Can they manage to a positive impact uh, based upon the goals that they set? So I would like to see again Richard, Joe, and Steve sit down and the next meeting come back with some targets of what they want those, those metrics to look like when I get to mid-year. And that okay, I think that will help us keep on track. It'll give us a, a target to shoot at and give us a much better chance of making sure we achieve something and we don't have to keep spending this million, million and a half, whatever we're doing year after year, because guys, that's an unsustainable process. That's my point. Thank you, Steve. I just wanted to mention one of the things I noticed as I was looking through the contracts. All of these firms have someone in them who has spent time becoming an expert on Malibu's process or have worked for Malibu. And I think that, that it's, it's telling uh, that uh, we were not able to find a single company that has enough people to handle it all by themselves. And, and I applaud uh what we have done here by by putting together people who actually know our process and not not sending us hiring us a bunch of people who have no knowledge of our process and are going to be more of a drag on the process than a help and i i was i wanted to applaud that mr silverstein 
Yeah, I just, I'm not sure where I'm going to come out on this, but I'm going to second Steve's motion just for purposes of discussion. Let's see if we can, if it gets there or not. Okay. And Steve's motion for the purpose of discussion was to. I will approve the plan, but I want, I want as a, as an amendment that Steve, Richard, and Joe come back to the next meeting with targets for what they want these metrics to look like when we get to June. And I guess I want to ask Richard Malika a question. Are you clear as to what the metrics that uh, Steve is referring to? Mr. McClick, Mr. Ewing, rather? You're, you're muted. Mr. Heard a little bit of you now, then went away. Oh, can you hear me at this time? Yes, we got gotcha. you. To mess with my microphone here. I apologize. Um, I believe and that was going to actually be a question of mine, and I believe it to be the metrics that we were presenting to the uh, ANF uh, subcommittee uh, about the performance standards that we'd like to achieve. And, and, and actually, those are ones I, I want to say we've held for years uh, as goals. Uh, it's just we've had issues with staffing to achieve that. Those are the metrics I'm looking for. I just want to know what they're going to look like when you get to June. What are you targeting to achieve with this million dollars we're spending for contract planners and all, and you've got this other group coming in and doing the research. Tell me what you want to get to when we get to June. That's what I want to know. Are we going to have a target that we're going to be, that's going to make us think that we've done the right thing? Certainly. I think the best way to sum it up would be responsiveness. What we presented the Zoe, or excuse me, Zoe ANF subcommittee was a list of items that we track: uh, responses, review cycles, uh, when a decision's reached, whether it's a favorable decision on the project or an unfavorable decision for the applicant. We have expectations, and we'd like to meet those, and we've established them by. Putting a certain number of days attached to those uh, accomplishments. And so the way we would be tracking it is through the existing software we have today, looking at how long it takes us to meet these certain response times, whether it be uh, a incomplete letter to an applicant or as far as rendering a decision on the project. But we would be tracking that. Uh, we have an idea right now of how many days it's taking us to get an incomplete letter. I can tell you off top of my head that the city's goal is 30 days, but if we're meeting that, the best we're coming, or excuse me, when I say if, I mean to say the closest we're coming to is probably about 60 or 70 days, and that's really too long. We need to be able to provide a, a much more thorough and timely review uh, to folks that make an application with the city. You haven't answered my question. When I get to June, what are those numbers going to look like? That's what I want you to give me. I want you to project what you want to achieve. I want a target. I want you guys to have a target that says, this is what we're shooting for. And let's find out if you can make that. We're spending a million and a half dollars plus $80,000 for a contract or a, a consultant. Let's, let's show the city that we can actually produce something with all that money. That's what I want to see. Understand, Council Member Uring, and I apologize because I'm trying to bring up those slides now, but I believe we had target dates on those slides. We had where we are today and where we want to be. Uh, with you each know, other. I've, I've, got, I've got the metrics right in front of me. What you've got is where you are today. There's nothing about where you're going to be in June. Okay. I, I apologize about that, but we do have an idea of where we want to be in June and, and we can get that. But by next meeting? Uh, yes, by the next council meeting, not an issue. Okay, cool. Mr. Silverstein. Yes, let's say I, I don't know what these specific metrics are, but I, I absolutely agree with the concept that it's a good management tool. In fact, it's a critical management tool to have goals that are objective and measurable because otherwise you're just always saying our goal is to do better. And then who knows whether you've succeeded or haven't succeeded. Uh, so, you know, I'm not really sure I understand specifically what this what these metrics are from this conversation, but the, the concept of having timelines, having goals that are measurable 
and then being able to um, compare where you are to where you said you would be, whether you succeeded or, or surpassed what you hoped to, or didn't make it. That's an important part of any management. And to some extent, we're managing management. So um, I think that's an appropriate thing to include in this. And I wasn't sure if they could get this done within two weeks, but Richard just said they could. So um, I support the motion for that reason. Okay. And I just wanted to say that I, I think that uh, I think that better response times will do a lot to reduce complaints. And that's that's a wonderful thing. And I'd also like to point out the study that we just authorized is not going to do anything. They're, it's going to take them six months till next May to come up with recommendations. So that expense is not have anything to do with what we're doing right now. And I think that I think this is a, a doable thing. So, okay. So, uh, is that, there is not a motion, but is there, you said you would support it if. No, there yeah. is. There's a, there's a motion to approve staff's recommendation right. subject to getting okay. um, goals delivered by the management team at the next meeting. At the next meeting. Okay. So, so, we're gonna... so to, to be clear, the, the it is staff's recommendation, but then staff is to report back at the next meeting with these um, metrics that you Target, that you... Targeted metrics, yes. Okay. Okay. Mikey, I'm going to recognize you. Yeah, just quickly. So wait, the motion is to approve something with something coming later, so it's already approved whether the, no matter what the answer is. That's what you basically just made a motion, if I understand it correctly. We're approving this with metrics coming in the future, but we're approving it now, no matter what they are. Is that for, is that correct? Is that what I, I mean? Think, I think it's we're approving it now with the stipulation that that uh, staff comes up with, with a metric that says what we're aiming at, what we're what we believe our our big audacious goal is and our and our one we think we're going to make for sure goal is that kind of thing my understanding is that the is that, that you will be approving the staff's recommendation as as proposed here and then staff's coming back with these metrics at the next meeting if they're not satisfactory you can keep working on those metrics but the 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 approval has gone through at this point is, is that, that accurate is, that is correct okay good all right we got a motion in the second. Kelsey, will you take the roll? Councilmember Urey? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. I believe that is the end of the consent calendar. So we are going on to it's uh, 847. Uh does anyone want to take a very short break? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, we'll be back. It's uh, 8.48. I'll meet you back here at 8.58.
Okay, it is now 8.58. We are rejoining our meeting already in progress. Or just about. Okay, we're all back. Now we're going to now do item number 4A followed immediately by item number 6C. Is that correct? We're going to hear them uh, simultaneously at the same time. Okay. So, how... great. We need two sim staff reports delivered simultaneously then. Or concurrently, sorry. <laughs> okay. I will merge them into, I'll, I'll put them together instead of trying to talk about two items at the exact same time. I don't have that skill. Okay. Well, you did a nice job of making a, a uh, opening thing here that has all the correct numbers on it. So we're ready to go then. Very good. Yes, this is one of three presentations. I had the other two just in case. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, what we're presenting to you this evening is uh, items, just to say it again for the public's benefit, item 4A and 6C together. And the reason being is that they both uh, need uh, each other in order to move forward. And this item tonight proposes 4A, which is a urgency ordinance that would allow for the issuance of temporary use permits uh, for the farmer's market so that it could be relocated into Legacy Park. And item 6C addresses a, the ability of the city manager to issue, to issue a waiver on behalf of the city to address a deed restriction that is listed on the title of Legacy Park. If I may have the next slide, please. What staff is proposing this evening, uh, after presenting this to the Zoe Races subcommittee at their meeting earlier this month, is Urgency Ordinance 505U. And that would allow for the farmer's market to be a temporary allowed use in the CV1 zone, which is currently Legacy Park. If I may have the next slide, please. What staff uh, presented to the subcommittee was a draft of an addition to our current TUP ordinance. We would be adding subsection M. This is something that we did similar for the farmer's market already to allow for their parking to be relocated. Uh, the CUP, if you may as you may remember, required that the parking be on site. And what we did is we provided for the ability for them to process an amendment and move their parking over to the chili cook-off site. So this uses similar language for that in that the issuance of a TUP for Legacy Park for a farmer's market would not count against the 60 calendar days uh, within one year, which a site can be used for temporary uses, nor towards the six events per parcel limit. So this would not conflict with any of the other events planned for the park. Uh, should a TUP be issued under this provision, it would be good for six months. Uh, some changes that we did make here, uh, and the reason why we made these changes that are coming up, is so that uh, I know there is an urgency uh, to get the, the farmer's market in Legacy Park. So what we did was uh, streamline the process. Uh, and so... A TUP that's applied for for the uh, relocation of the farmer's market would require a to be filed 16 days before the first event. Public notices would have to be mailed out 14 days prior to uh, the, the first farmer's market event. And also the planning director shall render a decision 12 days prior to the proposed 
I say use here, but the, 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 the farmer's market taking place. In addition, a facilities use permit would be required, and that's a standard requirement whenever using a, a city parcel. And this uh, urgency ordinance, uh, like the urge, like the ordinance that we presented for the relocation of parking, has an expiration date. The these two expiration dates match. This provision shall expire. The earlier of the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for Santa Monica College or on January 1st, 2024. And once again, that language mirrors what we did for parking. Uh, so that is the proposed urgency ordinance language that is contained in uh, the, the ordinance you have before you. If I may have the next slide, please. Should the applicant or should this urgency ordinance uh, be recommended for approval by by the council the next step would be for the operator to apply for a temporary use permit so that we can start processing that as we go through um, the period of time for the ordinance to take effect and the second part of this which is item 6c this evening is to authorize the city manager to sign a waiver on behalf of the city as a property owner of, of Legacy Park, uh, excuse me, as a property owner of some of the other benefited properties as they're termed in the title of Legacy Park, there is a deed restriction. And I think it's roughly, I wanna say it's six properties are listed as benefited properties. And Trevor, please correct me if I'm wrong here. And the city is now the owner of three of those parcels. And we will be seeking the same letter uh, from the other three property owners, private property owners. But now that the city is the owner of three of the parcels listed in the deed restriction, uh, we would need to have on record a, a letter waiving the six TUP limit uh, for the farmer's market. And so the action as part of 6C, if the council's uh, votes for it, would be to authorize the city manager to sign a waiver on behalf of the city. If I may have the next slide, please. The operator would also work with our cultural services department to, op to obtain a city facility permit. They are the department in the city which issues that permit. And then, of course, we would be processing the urgency ordinance as part of the proposed uh, temporary uh, use permit zoning text amendment that will be uh, heading its way uh, as directed by Zoe Races or as recommended by Zoe Races to the Planning Commission. So there will also be the inclusion of it as part of our update. If I may have the next slide, please. So as discussed in this presentation, the recommended actions are one, to adopt the urgency ordinance. And then the second recommended action is to authorize the city manager to sign a waiver on behalf of the city as the property owner of those benefited parcels. I am available for any questions, uh, should there be any, thank you. Bruce? Yeah, who owns the other three properties? It's more than three properties. It's twelve properties. Um, I just apologize. So it owns the nine properties. The Parentias own a number of them. When and staff is um, looking into who else owns the other ones, I don't have the information. Of, um, staff has been looking into it, but uh, that's if this is approved, the next step is to pursue that with the other owners of the properties. Do all twelve have to approve for this to be effective? They all have the rights to enforce the deed restrictions. It would set up that way. They're all owned by of Prencio at the time, but then uh, since that time they have been separated. So there's provisions providing for the Parencios um, to to have rights as a beneficiary and the owners of the properties. Has has any indication of willingness been received yet from any of the other property owners? Not at this point. I, so, you know, if this goes through, then uh, the next step will be um, to approach them that uh, the staff has put that in in motion and uh the, the approach will will start tomorrow if uh if this is approved by the council okay so are are we approving this 
subject to there being 12 consents or are we just approving this and that's an open issue? You're authorizing the, the city manager to execute a waiver of this in a form approved by the city attorney. And, um, you know, if, if, if we're able to, uh, ob to obtain the other ones, then we'll, we'll go forward and, re and record the, the waivers. If we don't get them all, then, you know, you, you've only, you know, we don't have, we, 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 there's no point in recording ours. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me ask it a different way. Uh, by approving, if, if assuming we approve the urgency ordinance, we're not approving this to occur unless and until all 12 property owners sign off. Is that correct? No, you are approving the, the urgency ordinances of now. The the waiver, what it does is it, is, is it allows more than, under the deed restriction, commercial activity is limited to six times per year. That would be used up pretty quickly by the farmer's market, which is commercial activity. And unless the city council intends to um, only allow six farmer's markets next year and no other commercial activity at Legacy Park, um, we would need that waiver to go forward. So uh, the urgency order is not dependent upon it. It's 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 uh, that it provides the ability to have more than six events and to have events other than six farmer's markets next year. So let me try to, so if I, tell me if I understand this correctly. If we approve the urgency ordinance there'll be the ability to have the farmer's market at the park, which otherwise doesn't exist. And there will be the ability to have it more than six times, but having it more than six times will also depend upon getting the waivers. Is that correct? Yes, because there's two separate limitations on it. Under the, co under the municipal code, you're limited to six events per property. Under the deed restriction, you're limited to six commercial activity events you know, per year. So they're independent, they're similar. Um, intentionally so I'm sure, um, but they are independent restrictions. But, but no more than six events will occur unless and until all 12 property owners sign off or the owners of all 12 parcels. Is that correct? I, no. I just don't want to, I don't want, I, I don't want to be in a position where we're approving something that isn't otherwise permissible under the deed restriction. That's what I'm trying to make sure is the case. The, the deed restriction, um, the administration would allow the farmer's market to operate there up to six times. So if you approve this, the farmer's market can go forward even without all the waivers in place. The reason for the waivers is so that, so that the farmer's market can operate more than six times. Um, you know, that, that, that's the, the issue is that is the deed restriction commercial limitation. So Without the waiver, there can only be six commercial events on the property um, per calendar year. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Sorry, does that make sense? I know it's it's. Well, I'm 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 still I'm phrasing it one way, and you're answering it a different way. So I I really to get clarity though, if we approve the urgency ordinance and we don't get the waivers, what happens? What happens is that the farmers market could occur. Up to up to six times per calendar uh, per calendar year, it would also exhaust all the commercial. Um, no other commercial events could happen at Legacy Park. Non-commercial events could happen at Legacy Park, but um, but no more. Th but no other. You know, if they use up all six of those, then no other commercial events could happen at Legacy Park. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yering. Whether this is helpful or not, I don't know. But we, and Bruce, we've been pursuing John Perencio, who is Larry, Jerry Perencio's son. Uh, we believe has got the ability to help us deal with these waivers. He lives, or he is, he's got a property in the neighborhood of Eberry Handelman uh, over in Escondido. He very has been trying to get a hold of John Perencio so we can talk with him and see if he's got any interest in helping us deal with this issue. So that process is in place. We'll see where the hell it goes. So far, I've got no solid information, one way or the other, of what's gonna happen. So, but just, we're, we're pursuing that. I may, I may be mistaken, but I don't think the Parencio family has any commercial interest in any of those properties at this point. So uh, I do have John's numbers if, if he could be of help, but I don't see how. The beneficiaries are the, are the, uh, are the those are attached to the ownerships of the other properties. 
It, it's it's both. You need a, approval from the parentios and from the owners of the different properties. I, I can get a hold of John. That would be great. Okay. All right. So All I'll right. make a I'll make a motion to move this forward to approve the staff recommendation. Uh, we need public oh. comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> If the council is done with their technical questions, just want to check for you. We do not have any public speakers signed up for item 4A, and I'm looking now, and no, we don't have any speakers signed up for item 6C either. So that concludes public comment for these items. Wow. Thank you for keeping us legal, Kelsey. I know it's difficult. I'll second the motion. So a motion was made to, to approve 4A and, and 6C, correct? Yeah, and we got a second. Okay, we got a second. Bruce, did you want to speak again? Yeah, well, I, those were just my questions to staff. I thought we were going to have public comment. Um, I, I have one other question and one, I have two, two other questions. Um, does the farmer's market have um, in place authorization to re return to the parking lot where it was at the earlier of the, uh, upon occupancy of the um, college by Santa Monica College? Or is that still an open question? Do we know that? To my knowledge, the, it, that is the plan. Yes, I, I don't mind looking further into it. Uh, but in looking back, as, as part of this, like I mentioned, we looked at what, what happened for the parking. It, it appears that they are to go back to that college uh, lot for the entire event being the farmer's market and the parking. It's just the, the temporary relocation of the construction isn't working and, it, and it's pushing, uh, pushing her out essentially. But they're going to go, the, the plan is for them to return to the way it was once the college is open. Correct. There's been no uh, indication of filing for a new conditional use permit or anything of that nature. And um, the farmer's market is a not-for-profit, is, is that correct? Yes. Do have, this isn't going to interfere with my approval of this tonight, my vote to approve it, but have we seen a income and expense statement from the farmer's market to know um, what its, how its operations are? I have not. Has the city ever obtained that? You know, for all I know, they're operating on a on a shoestring budget, or they could be making half million dollars a year. I, I'm we don't know that, do we? I, I'm not certain and, of the. Year. I I remember being at the hearing for the CUP originally, uh, but I'm not certain if that's in the file. Bruce, the commercial operation that we've been talking about here is the individual vendors who hopefully are making a profit, because if they aren't, they aren't going to come back. Two weeks no, not, from now. Yeah, no, no, I understand that, Paul. I'm not. I'm not talking about the vendors. I'm talking about the oh, the umbrella operation that that oversees the whole event. My understanding is that the the umbrella organization is is a duly licensed uh, nonprofit and filing tax returns on an annual basis that that support that. But I'm not I'm not a an auditor. Those are my comments. Those are my questions. Thank you. Okay. All right. All the item. Very good. We have a motion and a second to approve items four A and six C. Will you be kind enough to take the roll, Kelsey? Councilmember Yuri? Yes. I, I, I need to read the ordinance. I'm sorry. Will you please read the ordinance, Trevor? Bring it up here. All right. This would be ordinance number 505U, an urgency ordinance of the city of Malibu to temporarily authorize a farmer's, should say a farmer's market 
at a publicly owned park by amending Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 17.68 temporary use permits and finding the action exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and setting forth the facts constituting such urgency. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. That takes us to item 6A. If I have kept track of things correctly. Good evening, Mayor Gasanti, City Council. The item before you now for consideration is a fee waiver for the Malibu Community Labor Exchange, which is application for a conditional use permit to operate a day labor program on the county property in the Civic Center area. On October 10th, the City Council received an update on the city's um, permanent trailer project for the Malibu Community Labor Exchange, also referred to as MCLE. Council directed staff to bring back an item um, with a definitive recommendation on how to proceed with the permanent trailer project on the county property within three months. Since then, MCLE has been working with the city to develop a permanent and temporary solutions for its continued operation on the county property once um, the Santa Monica College campus is complete, which is currently estimated to be um, operational um, and open for instruction in February. The MCLE is in the process of securing a cargo van um, that is to be outfitted as a mobile office to be put in service on a temporary basis on the county property. And the planning department has determined that MCLE needs a conditional use permit for the operation of its day labor program on the county property. MCLE is currently preparing to submit its CUP application. And the planning department estimates that this fee would um, would be in the amount of $3,784. Council is being asked to consider waiving this fee um, because MCLE is a nonprofit that uh, provides support to low and moderate income individuals looking for work. And the city has a long history of supporting this organization and its operations. As you may recall from previous reports, um, the MCLE has operated a day labor program on the county property since the early 90s, and the city has provided uh, federal community development block grant funding to this organization since um, fiscal, approximately fiscal year 92-93 and has also provided the MCLE with general fund grants for its operations as well. In recognition of the community benefit that MCLE provides and the council's longstanding uh, support for the organization, council is asked to consider waiving the CUP permit fee application, I mean application fee. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Do we have any members of the public who signed up to speak on this item? Yes, you have one speaker signed up, Kay Gabbard, and we'll hear from her now. Hi, Kay, are you available? Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Thank you very much, um, Mayor Grisanti and Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein and City Council members. Um, thank you for considering this request to waive uh, the permit fees for our CUP uh, to put us in a new location temporarily and then permanently. Um, as a member of the board of the Malibu Community Labor Exchange, um, I want to say that we are uh, very thankful and um, grateful that we are moving forward. Um, and it is no small feat since we are not builders ourselves, and we are working with uh, not only Santa Monica College in Malibu City, but also LA County. So there are three different groups who have to give us permission to do this. Um, without Elizabeth, we would be way out in left field. Without Richard and Yolanda and Joe and Fletcher, we would not be where we are right now. So we are very thankful for um, the Malibu City staff who have gone out of their way to think outside the box to get us to where we are right now. Um, we look forward to being on the beautiful new Santa Monica College 
campus and we look forward to the relationship that we will build with the faculty and st students of Santa Monica College, similar to what we have done with Pepperdine University. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Kay. And Mayor, mm -hmm. that concludes public comment. Thank you very much. I see Steve Uring's hand followed by Karen Ferris. Uh, just a quick, uh, and for Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you've done yeoman's duty here dealing with this one and farmer's market. So I thank you for all your efforts. Um, I, mean, I, I think we've kept you busy. Uh, I think that's an understatement. Uh, what is a cargo van? What you, you mentioned there, what, what, are, what is a cargo van that they're going to put in there? Do you know? I mean, I just don't know what that is. Um, I, I believe, I mean, the, there's different things for different types of uh, mobile offices. Right. Um, I, I don't know if a carbogram typically uses them uh, as an office, but um, that's probably a more affordable um, option. What is it? It's just, it's a, like the stuff they, um, you take off the ships. One of those, is that what it is? No, or? no. Oh, no, no, no. It, it, I believe it's more like it's just a van that is open in the back for large bulky uh, items. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So it's on wheels, it's movable. Yeah. Right? Yes, and that is the critical component. Uh, gotcha. As long as it is on wheels and is movable, it is not a structure. It's not a permanent structure. It's subject to the building code and um, and other provisions. Elizabeth, you're very good. Thank you very much. Karen. Thanks, Paul. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you, Kay, for speaking, and I move to approve this item. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to approve the item. Now we're discussing Bruce. Yeah, where's the van going to park at night? Sorry, I'm <laughs> fiddling with my buttons. Um, the the area um, that has always been identified for the Malibu Community Labor Exchange is the northwest corner of the property. So that is the the area that um, MCLE is seeking to park. Um, its van and operate out of. Uh, oh, basically, it's just going to stay in one place all the time, it, but it will be movable for purposes of the building code. Is that accurate? I don't know how they intend to operate their van, um, but it will be movable for the purposes of the building code. Okay. But it, but during the hours of operation, as well as when it's just parked, it, the intent is that it'll be in the same place. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. Are there any other comments? We have a first and a second. Kelsey, would you like to take the roll? Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Rearing? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, that brings us to item number 6B which is a city response letter to notice of preparation of an environmental impact report for the Malibu lower cost accommodations public works plan. Do we have any, a staff report? Yes, good evening, Chair or Mayor Grisanti and members of the city council. The item before you is a draft comment letter that uh, has been prepared in response to a notice of preparation that was issued by MRCA uh, for a plan uh, that they've entitled the Malibu uh, Lower Cost Accommodations Public Works Plan. That public works plan includes uh, both the a site at the Malibu Bluffs uh, property and also Ramirez Canyon Park. The uh, both sites are basically proposed as camping sites, has multiple camping sites in both sites. The as noted in the draft letter in your agenda, the, uh, the city has objected in the past and continues to object to the use of a public works plan to process development projects in the city. Uh, the appropriate permit would be a coastal development permit, not a public works plan. So that is noted in the comment letter. Uh, but uh, that said, uh, the comment letter also covers all of the subject 
uh, areas that sh that the EIR should study, and that includes things like the noise and lighting impacts, the uh, traffic parking, and of course fire safety. Uh, fire safety being a big component, um, given the history of fires in Malibu. So the letter includes all of those uh, components, and staff is seeking any additional comments from the. Uh, City Council that they wish to include in the letter. Uh, the comment period ends December the 16th. Um, and so after uh, the conclusion of uh, this meeting, staff will revise the comment letter um, as needed and submit it to uh, MRCA um, as it relates to the EIR. The MRCA indicate indicated in a in a prior presentation that they um, anticipate the draft uh, EIR will be available sometime in the summer or fall of 2023. And with that, that concludes uh, staff's presentation. Thank you. Do we have anybody from the public? Has anybody signed up to speak? Yes, you have 17 speakers signed up for this item. The first two are Richard Troop, Josep uh, Kuzin, Natalie Kuzin, John Ziffrin, and Howard Bernstein. We will hear from, I'm sorry, I'm looking for our first speaker. Uh, we'll hear from Richard Troop first. Mr. Troop, are you available? I am available. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I'm sorry that I've kept you so long. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Well, I'm just watching that the no time, which is even better. I can keep on talking forever. Anyway, I, I'm Dick Troop, and my wife Cindy and I have been uh, Malibu Road residents for just about 33 years. We are totally opposed to the MRCA's proposal and hope that the, uh, that, that the City Council works very hard in, in preventing M the MRCA from proceeding on either of these sites. Uh, during the last 33 years, Sydney and I have experienced earthquakes, over 60 mile an hour winds, as well as super high tides, close by fires and evacuations. The fire on January 8th, 2007 is especially relevant to the MRCA's proposed Bluffs Park campground and related activities. On that January 8th, it is believed that a person in a car on PCH pretty close to the new Bluffs Park campgrounds proposed locations, which as, 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 as Mayor Grisanti noted in the public meeting, will house as many as 800 people, flipped a lighted cigarette out of his or her vehicle. About eight minutes later, the ensuing flames reached down to the road and blown by western winds, reached up, up, up to the first of eight homes to be damaged or destroyed. Not a lot, but for the people on the road, it was pretty horrible. It was just lucky that several fire engines were posted around the side of Pepperdine and some were able to get to the road in just a few minutes to stop the spread of these flames. But the homes were still severely damaged or destroyed. All of Mas Malibu, as you know, has been designated a very high fire hazard severity zone. That's astounding. Last year, more than 20 fires in Malibu originated from homeless encampments. Cindy and I agree that introducing new campgrounds will definitely increase fire danger in Malibu, and along with the campers in these new campsites, we and our fellow residents on Malibu Road will be direct targets of these blazes. I've read the city's comments on the scope of MRCA's proposals, and the staff has done a ter terrific job. Based on what I've read, it seems appropriate for the city to request, if not demand, that MRCA withdraw its PWP and comply with the law. How do MRCA's proposal make any sense at all? We need to stop it now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. True. Our next speaker is Huzep Kausen, followed by Natalie Kausen, followed by John Ziffrin and Howard Bernstein. I believe uh, Huzep and Natalie are on the same account. Josep, are you available? Yes. Hello, Councilman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. As a Malibu Road homeowner and a citizen, my concerns are for you folks to minimize as much as possible the fire danger and the safety on PCH, especially with potential 480 campers and the additional 400 cars on the highway. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Natalie Cousin, followed yeah. by John Ziffrin, Howard Bernstein, and Craig Hill. Thank you. Natalie, are you available? Hi, yes, I'm available. Thank you, council mem members, for the opportunity to speak. I just wanted to echo everything that my dad said. The additional increased fire hazard and additional traffic on the highway would impose all kinds of dangers. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Ziffrin, followed by Howard Bernstein, Craig Hill, and Ryan Drexler. Uh, thank Ziffrin. you. First of all, thank you for your service to the community. Uh, your your uh, diligence is greatly appreciated. We've been residents of Malibu since 1961. Uh, we lost our house in one of the fires in 1971. The safety of our community, um, not just for our house, but for all of the residents of Malibu Road who have lost their houses uh, is paramount. Additionally, we've had uh, two break-ins to our house from people coming in through the public access um, and have been reported to the uh, Sheriff's Department. Um, the density of um, traffic on the highway and the density of um, folks coming uh, onto the beach through the public accesses, which are not consistently uh, preserved, um, has personally uh, threatened our safety. And um, the idea of adding this um, without adequate supervision and protection is a liability that uh, we will take legal action and do whatever is necessary as a community to protect ourselves, our livelihood, the safety of our families. And we greatly appreciate um, your diligence and support of objecting to this because it is a public hazard, it is a private hazard, and it is uh, a danger to our um, families that we care so deeply about, as well as the community. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is Howard Bernstein, followed by Craig Hill, Ryan Drexler, E. Barry Haldeman, and Cookie Shapiro. Mr. Bernstein, are you available? Howard, you should see a pop-up ask you to unmute on your screen. I'm sorry, I am available. I am unmuted. Thank you very much for allowing me in. Uh, it has been a very interesting evening. And I appreciate all that you've done. You guys sit there for a very long time. Uh, and uh, I, I give you credit for it. You know, the matter at hand, and everybody has spoken very clearly about it so far. And I'm sure you've got another 15 people to go. But it's it's common sense that that is that is just rattling in my head about how we can even talk about allowing the possibility of fires. And I say that because I, I, I'm, I'm fine with people who want to go camp. And we had been through this once before, a few years back when this came up, and it disappeared. But one of the things that was there was, oh, and it's going to be policed. Somebody's going to watch him. They then said there's not going to be anybody there to police it. And people will light fires. It's normal. Camping does that. And when you're in a wind area that is coming due south, out of the mountains. It happens all the time. I mean, we live through the Ramirez area. I'm watching people I know who lost homes. It's so quick and it's so close. And to even discuss it is, is, is bizarre. To even have the possibility of it is bizarre. And quite frankly, for those of you that are on the city council who represent us, 
it's our expectation that you are going to stand up as loudly as we are and as vocal as we are to oppose this. And I'm, I don't know where we go. You've heard it already. We're going to go to court. <laughs> That's a shame, except lawyers will make money. But the point is, it's, it's stupid. And, and it's dangerous. And hopefully this will end again. I don't know why he keeps coming back, but he does. Anyhow, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Ryan Drexler, E. Barry Haldeman, Cookie Shapiro, and Jill Goldman. Hey, Craig, are you available? Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I made oral comments in MRCA's Zoom. Um, I have a few more here. Richard and Joyce, the staff report is great. Um, first thing, this is obvious, but it's worth being explicit that at a fundamental level, this is either camping or it isn't. I'm not sure of the implications, but it looks like MRC is trying to have its cake and eat it too. Certainly a basic campsite can't count as affordable housing, but then if they build a foundation or a permanent platform for a glamping yurt, then it becomes more like a cabin, then it's arguably housing, in which case it's not a public work and would require a CDP. So I'd just say double check their definitional assumptions. They may be selectively bending some places analogous to the way that Trump will value a property high for one purpose, but low for another. The next points are mainly with respect to Bluffs Park, not Ramirez, and regard the CEQA requirements pertaining to project need and or alternatives. Proximity to real hiking trails is an essential element of a campground. I can't think of any campgrounds that don't have access to proper trails. At worst, you have to cross the PCH, such as at Thornhill Broom, but then there you have immediate access to many miles of trails around Sycamore Park in La Jolla Valley. At Bluffs, there are a few nature walks, but nothing longer than a dog walk. No direct access to any trails across the highway, no path to the backbone trail, for example. To get to a trailhead, you'd have to hike along PCH in front of the commercial zone. From the crosswalk at John Tyler to the trailhead at Puerco is 1.2 miles, or from John Tyler to the Sarah Juan trailhead at Corral is one and a half miles. So before you even get to the trail, you're looking at a round trip hike of two and a half or three miles on pavement next to a busy highway. Um, also, the noise study should evaluate not just the noise produced by the project, but noise effects on the project. For example, is it appropriate to site a campground directly under the flight path of a fairly constant stream of helicopters? Private, Coast Guard, fire, sheriff, even military copters fly past within 300 to 500 feet, and they're loud. Similarly, on many nights, platoons of loud motorcycles and muscle cars rev up and down the PCH. If visitors can't even get proper sleep, that alone could make the site unsuitable for outdoor camping. So the noise should be studied from, from both sides. And relatedly, there could be some FAA rule about siting either new housing or recreational facilities so close to a flight path. And um, finally, I don't know how big a deal this might be, but the field at Bluffs Park is designated as an emergency helicopter landing zone, Hellespot number 88B. And so I wonder if FAA regulations would prohibit a campsite from being too close to a landing pad like that. Um, hopefully I'll have time to get some written comments in to follow up my oral comments, but uh, so far I think you guys are doing a great job. So thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker would be Ryan Drexler, but I don't see him in the meeting. So we'll see if we can circle back to him later and we'll hear from E. Barry Haldeman followed by Cookie Shapiro, Jill Goldman and Howard Redsky. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Barry. Thank you. Um, might will be short and sweet. Uh, one of the things that I think this, the, the city should do is to reach out to the fire department and to the sheriff's department to determine whether the MRCA has contacted them at all and how they factor into this. I think that's a very critical thing. It's probably in the letter. I haven't had a chance to read it but it's, it's traffic problems, it's crime problems. And our experience has been that the MRCA never deals with the local agencies and will end up picking up the pieces for the lack of rangers and the lack of the fire department of the MRCA. Um, I would also suggest that other people write letters with their own questions as well, because I think it doesn't hurt to bombard the people who are uh, doing the assessment with every possible question so that we bring up everything we can. And I'm sure that the 
uh, the city letter is very extensive, and I think we just do whatever you can think of so that they're buried with uh, with paper. Um, I'd also request that you designate somebody on the staff that could help anybody who wants to make their own objection. They could call up somebody, find out some details, etc. Uh, I think that's very important to coordinate the community with with the city. Uh, we also should re reach out to our new board of supervisor member because the Ramirez part, I believe, is in the county. And so I think we need to pull that in as well as our other representatives. So that's all I have to say, but I would urge people to also write their own letters so they see it's not uh, just one, one party. And the other thing I would suggest is our position, we have to be careful, our position can't really be a NIMBY kind of position. I think our position is we embrace the open spaces in Malibu. That's something we all want. But but the way they're doing it will create a, a situation where it could burn down and then nobody will have the benefit of the open spaces. So thank you very much and uh, keep at it. And I'm very glad the city's getting involved in this uh, situation. Thank you, Barry. Our next speaker is Cookie Shapiro, followed by Jill Goldman, Howard Rudsky, and Blake Megdal. Ms. Shapiro, are you available? Cookie, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute, or you may have to press star six on your phone since you're also calling in. Hello, can you hear me? We hear you. Ah, great. Well, I double underscore everything that has been said on this phone call. Um, it's apparent that this issue is being universally rejected by all of us living on Malibu Road. But I have a question. I am not familiar with the process of the MRCA's decision making. Do you have any idea by what process it was decided to put this on Malibu Road. Anybody there? We're, we're here, but you're, it, after you get back talking, we, we get to answer. I'm sorry. It's, it's not a back and forth, but you can, you can ask any questions and the council can answer after the public hearing is closed. I'm sorry, what did you say? You did not have an answer? I said you can ask your questions after the public comments close, then the, the, the staff or the, the council can answer the questions. Okay. Okay, that's it. Thank you very how much. How do I, well, let me ask you, how do I get to ask you questions after this? You ask all your questions during your time, hopefully. And when we go around, we will, give you the best answers we know. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jill Goldman, followed by Howard Rudsky, Blake Megdal, Taylor Megdal, and Elliot Megdal. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you. On behalf of my mother, Lynn Silbert, who's also um, on this call, we're longtime residents also of Malibu Road, I guess 24 years, and we also just are agreeing with um, everybody that we have real, real concerns about the danger of um, having what they're calling flameless camping or cold camping um, so close to so many homes. Um, my mother remembers very well the 2007 um fire on uh, Old Malibu Road and just how quickly as people have articulated that happened. Um, it's just way, way too dangerous. We believe it's way too dangerous for us and our family. Um, the risk of fire, it, you know, is just, again, as someone else said, this is just seems totally crazy, but um, that's it. And also adding one thing in from my son, who's another generation and who is a camper and, um, it's just, I, I don't believe the idea that anybody is not going to uh, light fires. It's just what campers do, their fires. And I don't know how they could possibly police and regulate that. So in that windy area, it seems ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous to have these um, chef camping so close to homes. 
Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Joe. Our next speaker is Howard Rudsky, followed by Blake Megdal, Taylor Megdal, Elliot Megdal, and Ryan. Mr. Rudsky, are you available? I am. Good evening. I think the letter that Joyce put together is very good, but what I would like to see added to the letter is a city work with people that know how to react if MRCA doesn't make the area safe and the highway safe and put that in the letter so it's factual. So they know that if they don't do what you're asking them to do, that there are consequences. Thank you. Okay. I Thank don't you. see our next three speakers, Blake Magdal, Taylor Magdal, or Elliot Magdal in the meeting, but we'll see if we can circle back and we'll hear from Ryan next. Hi, Ryan, are you available? Yes, thank you. I emailed the city council and the uh, city attorney and city manager earlier today with some concerns because this is a reboot of the city's court case, uh, the BS 121 650 and the consolidated case to BS 121. Let me read the rest of the number 820. And that resulted not only in a court decision in favor of the city, but in an ordered stipulation of the payment of attorney's fees back to the city and an additional 200000 And if this, if the MRCA or Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy were to resubmit as a um, override public works type plan, anything similar to the plan that was rejected by the court. And I would submit that there are elements in this plan because they're basically the same, let's put campsites all over Bluffs Park open space. And whether or not that includes now mitigation with buried or high pressure, maybe put out fires if then when they occur, that is all development, which is under the city's uh, designated authority as established by the, the judge is primarily and generally with the city. And there's a very narrow exception for when an override can occur, whereby authority to construct all this by the Coastal Commission itself. Policies that they're set up under the city's existing LCP zoning ordinances, which are all part of the um, LCP. Uh, I'm sorry, it says my internet connection dropped. Um, I don't know if you heard me on that, but the um, the chances of this surviving all of that are pretty nil. And if it did, the MIDI for a video fire detected fire suppression system of world-class stuff, that those would all be required. And I don't think that any of that is even possible or doable without a budget um, of something a Disneyland would need to have. So um, the yurts were proposed 20 years ago for camping once before, and I think they were considered to be development. And so I would ask you to investigation budget for this item and to petition the court itself for direct authority to reject this application from the Coastal Commission and, if anything, assign it to the city itself, because that's basically where we left it. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. And, Mayor, I've checked, but I still don't see Ryan Drexler, Blake Megdal, Taylor Megdal, or Elliot Megdal in the meeting, so that concludes public comment for this item. Oh, Thank I'm you. sorry, there was one speaker to sign up as I spoke from Joe Drummond. Hi, Joe, are you available? Excuse me. Joe, are you available? Hi, thanks so much. Thank you so much for fighting for this for our community. I just was listening to everyone and I just wanted to just put in my two cents. Um, obviously you got the Public Works Commission 
um, recommendations, fire risk, air quality, traffic safety, light, lighting, noise, views and community character, wildlife and extra protection. But I also agree with what Ryan sent you all today that this should be considered development and the override of the Coastal Commission's approval of the former MRCA PWP and the PWP lawsuits, which included the attorney's fees, were resolved in the city's favor. So this order happened in 2012 and subjects the MRCA SMMC to pay an additional fee of $200,000 to the city if the SMMC or MRCA is granted approval for certain similar projects related to this litigation. So I would hope that somewhere it was strongly worded that um, they would have to pay a fee if if they try to do this again with this Coastal Commission, like trying to pass off camping as a PWP, which is obviously it isn't. And to, I, I know you've already written that it should be development in the LCP, but just to make it very strong that they have to put in a coastal development permit if it worst case. So thank you. Thank you very much, Joan. And may you're still not seeing the speakers we missed earlier. That concludes public comment for this item. Okay. Thank you. Uh, who wants to open up? Karen? Thanks, Paul. Um, I want to thank all the speakers. Um, I agree with you. It is dangerous. Uh, if you've read the draft uh, letter prepared by the city, it outlines all the ways um, that it is dangerous puts us at risk uh, and is not something that I think any of us want to see happen. Probably the worst thing that's happened while I've been on the council uh, was the vote, which I uh, opposed. Uh, a motion was made to swap Charmley Park back to the MRCA, uh, excuse me, back to the city in exchange for Bluffs Park. That's what set this in motion. Had the city kept that property, kept the bluffs, we wouldn't be talking about this. So I know that's not helping, but I wanna make sure everybody understands the history here. And if you look on page 12 of the staff report for this agenda item, you'll see the council agenda item from December 26, 2012, proposing that swap. So that's really too bad. Uh, and as Lloyd Ahern said, when this happened uh, about three years ago, when that vote, that three, two vote to give the bluffs back to Joe Edmiston and the MRCA, he said, why would you do something that's on the 50 yard line of the city? And for everybody on Malibu road, right above your homes. So I am really, really sorry that we're all in this position right now. What I will say is that I think the letter the city wrote, given the circumstances that we're in, is excellent. So I want to thank the staff for that. Um, I'm going to move to approve the letter as is, and I'm sure that other council members will have comments, uh, but that's my motion. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'll second it for second it. Good. Bruce, we have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Sure. So this is all what I've called before a kabuki dance. This letter, the letter's great. The letter makes most of the, the, the important salient points. I, I thought Craig Hill raised some other good technical points that ought to be considered. I'm sure members of the community are gonna all be writing their comments. And ultimately a court's gonna decide this because if this can be done, but the real issue here, just so everyone understands, is PWP versus CDP. If it's a PWP, if it's legitimate for MRCA to do it that way, then no matter what the comments, no matter what the reasons, no matter what the problems, they're going to find rationales to do what they want to do. Coastal is going to agree. Coastal is going to allow them to do what they want to do so long as they can justify it. And as long as they have the right to make that decision through this PWP process, they will justify it. And we're just spitting in the wind. If they need a CDP, it's in our, it's in our lap. 
they have to satisfy us that they can go forward. And while there are certain situations, rare situations, where a government body is compelled to grant a CDP because there's no legal justification for not doing so, there's a world of reasons for denying CDPs. So the issue here is PWP versus CDP. All the other stuff is window dressing. So what I'd like to understand actually from our legal counsel is when is the lawsuit that requires them to get a CDP ripe? Because that's the only way this is gonna be stopped is they have to get a CDP. And also when's the statute of limitations against bringing that lawsuit? Those are two sure. questions. And, 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 the other, and the other legal handle, by the way, is, you know, if, just so people understand again, if, if it's a legal issue, which of these permits are you required? A court decides that. It's pretty black and white objective decision making. I mean, we won't know what the answer is going to be until a court decides, but courts aren't going to be deciding whether the project makes sense. They're going to just be deciding which process is the legally proper process. Seek was the other handle. I'd like to also under, understand do we have rights to compel CEQA and announce, to compel an EIR? Because again, they'll do their EIR, eventually they'll find that it's okay, but it'll slow things down. So the questions I have for our council are, when can we sue to require a CDP? When are we too late to require a CDP? And I think the, rel the residents need to understand this too for their lawsuit. And um, what rights do we have to compel an EIR uh, when, when can we seek to compel that? When is it too late to compel that? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, you know, you know, what we have here on the agenda is, is just the consideration of our letter response to the NO, the NOP here in this situation. So I don't want to get too far down the road in terms of, um, you know, in terms of strategy that we're going to use to ad address, you know, what's being proposed here by the MRCA. And part of that too is something that would be an attorney-client privilege, you know, um, communication with counsel. And I wouldn't want to tip too much about this, the, this, the strategy of the city and, you know, um, different options before the city about when to challenge this and how to do it. But fair we are enough. not at this, no, at this point. Trevor, fair, mm -hmm. fair enough. I don't want to have you discuss privileged information if that's what it is. And I've, I've been critical of that in the past. So can, can we schedule a closed session meeting about anticipated or potential litigation so we can get answers to these questions? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so I mean, I, I support the letter, but again, yeah, just so everyone understands, the letter is window dressing. At the end of the day, they're gonna do what they wanna do. The only way to stop this is if they have to ask us to, for permission. Good. Who would like to go next? I'll, I'll jump in if, if that's okay. Uh, one of the, I, I want to thank all the people who spoke. Uh, the, I was, uh, I got Ryan's letter this afternoon where he talks about a, a $200,000 fine that's out there that we can collect on if they resubmit what they basically what they basically the same project that they did before they if they try to use this again is that something that you have had an opportunity and I'm talking to you Trevor to to uh, determine was part of the settlement agreement there are there are differences between sort of what's being proposed here and what was dealt with before and, and part of this is too is that it's not fully fleshed out at this point in time we don't have a full project before us this is not something that's been approved in full um you know right now we're just at the nlp process um in terms of scoping out you know what this is going to be so um at this point this is something else that you know if we're going to have a closed session to discuss this that i think be more okay. appropriate for us to, to to deal with in that context very good Mr. Uring, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to, I sort of agree with what Bruce said. I'd love to get this closed session so we can really understand <clears throat> where what our options are, what we should do. I mean, this is, we need a strategy to figure out how to fight this. So the sooner we can move that closed session, the better off I think we're gonna be. That's it. Okay. So can, can I ask for a friendly amendment? And Trevor, tell me if this is inappropriate for this, but um, the, the friendly amendment would be that we, that in addition, we direct 
council and staff to promptly schedule a closed session, or at least once we have our new council in, in, in place, unless it will be too late, um, to discuss our legal options as part of this. Bruce? I, don't think you, I don't think you need to amend it. We will bring this back with it when you have the new council as, as soon as, as we can. And so um, okay. we can just All take right. that question from you. I'm going to take a moment to say the obvious here. The the uh, comment period ends the December the 16th. So I, I don't know when we're going to schedule this for the new council who are installed on the 11th, correct? 12th. Yeah, we, this is not something that needs to be scheduled before that. You have the letter to preserve the city's arguments at this point, and this is very preliminary at this point in time in terms of what the comments are. So there's not a necessity that this happens before then, um, but we will bring it back to the the new council okay. as soon as, as as we can. Okay, great. So is is the plan? I'm sorry, Mr. Uring. Sorry, I should have brought my hand down. I, that was that was left over. Okay. All right. So is our, our Joyce? Do you think we have given you any any uh, guidance? I personally think you've done a great job of drafting this. But is there is there any guidance that you have received from that you listened to the public comments or or what we've said that causes you to go, yeah, we can do this. We, we should add that there. What are your thoughts on that? You, you're, you're muted. There you are. I'm challenged tonight with my video and <laughs> my mute. Um, Yes, so generally I have, um, I've, I've listened to what the public has said and what the council has said. And for the most part, all of that is covered in the city's letter. Um, I could fine tune it a little bit, uh, but generally um, the comments in the city's letter, um, I received from all of the city departments and of course the public safety commission and public works commission and uh those comments were consistent with what the public and council are saying so i think i think the letter is uh, pretty much ready to go with just a few tweaks okay So Joyce, you're asking for uh, the, the approval of, of the letter with also direction that I, uh, to, to make any, any of the uh, changes that you, um, minor changes you deem necessary based on the comments received tonight. That is correct. Yes. Trevor, I'll, I'll make that motion, Trevor. Okay. I'll second that motion. I thought we already had a motion. I, thought we're, I, I made a motion. Is okay. it the substitute okay. motion? You, you could take it as a friendly amendment or as a new motion, which, which would you there. like it to be a friendly amendment? Sure, fine, and thank you, Joyce. And who is who? I'll accept the second. Okay. Except All the right, amendment. we have a motion and a second to go forward with uh, Joyce uh, adding some minor changes, work with Trevor, and get this off to. In, in plenty of time for the December 16th cutoff, right? Yes. Okay. Kelsey, would you like to take the roll, please? Council Member Fair? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Rearing? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Mr. Mayor, there was a question from the audience member about how MRCA makes its decisions. Uh, just for the record, if, if they're still listening, you know, they have a board that does make these decisions, but they mostly come at the impetus of the executive director, you know, Joe Edmiston himself. I think we all are nodding in agreement. Thanks for the reminder on that question, Trevor. And, and I'm sorry I didn't do that earlier. Yeah. Okay. Well, this meeting is adjourned. Adios, so, guys. See you in December. I really appreciate it, everybody. In two weeks. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye.